I hate working with my intellectually disabled co-worker. I am a baker at a busy place, and one of my co-workers is intellectually disabled. This girl cannot keep up with anything. I have had to start batches over because she doesn't do things when they're supposed to get done. I ask her to do something that should take a min maximum, and 30 minutes later it's not done, and too late to do it now because the pastries are too cold. She seems to just meander from task to task, doing jack all, when there are a million things to get done that are a part of her job. I am constantly picking up slack when she is working with me, essentially doing the job of one and a half people. Because of this, there have been numerous instances where a batch has had to get thrown out because it was in the proofer too long because I was busy doing her job. She's just so slow. Yesterday someone ordered donut holes, but I hadn't done them yet, so I quickly threw them in the fryer, glazed them, and asked her to finish them up while I finished the rest of the customer's order. When I looked at her, she was still bagging the donut holes, putting them in the bag one at a time. I am at my wit's end. Just now I had to throw out a bunch of donuts because she didn't toss them in cinnamon and sugar mix while they were warm. A very quick and easy task. And when I asked her to toss the new batch, I watched her struggle to put on the plastic gloves, take a few seconds to stare at the plastic glove that she dropped on the floor, watched her slowly walk the glove over to the trash can, miss the trash can, stare at the glove for a couple of seconds again, finally pick it up and put it in the trash, slowly walk over to the donuts, pick two up and rub them together, and then drop them in the cinnamon and sugar mix one at a time. It has gotten to the point where as soon as I open the door to let her into the shop, I get mad as soon as I see her face. I feel like a horrible person, but she's driving me nuts, so I kind of don't care if it makes me ableist at this point. I don't want her to get fired because that may be discrimination, but she can't handle the tasks at this place. I've given her pointers multiple times on how to be more efficient, but to no prevail. In the comments, Tronic50 says, You need to ask your boss to work a shift or two with the two of you so they can see what is going on and make an appropriate decision on her employment. OP replies, I think the owners are aware that it's an issue already. One time, one of them came in and saw a bunch of dishes in the sink, dirty floors, and dishes still stacked on the rack, and they asked me, Was Blank here this morning? And when I said yes, they asked me, what did she do all morning, just sit and watch you bake? And I kinda just shrugged. Edit, I feel like I should specify this. As of maybe an hour ago, I was under the impression that this was likely the only job this disabled girl was able to land. I was reluctant to tell the owners about her poor performance because I didn't want her to get fired. While she does her job poorly, she is very sweet, and now that she's been there for a while, myself and the other co-workers have grown quite attached to her. Back then, I covered for her because I was still holding out hope that she would get the hang of it. Now I know that they are likely getting her wages federally subsidized, and she is not in danger of ending up on the street if I'm honest about her performance. I will take this issue up with the owners, though. The people in my comments section telling me that I need to use my words next time like an adult, or let her fail, need to develop some empathy. Jesus Christ, I hope none of y'all have kids with disabilities. Single Vacation 427 says, You shouldn't have shrugged. You need to communicate and explain that she did not do anything and she actually made your job more difficult. If they want to keep her employed, they can have her do something else that she can actually accomplish and doesn't interfere with your job. You are not getting paid to train her. Don't you realize that it's very unsanitary to have someone who struggles to put gloves on or who cannot clean? You are making food in a place with dirty floors. Don't you have a health code? Exactly. I have had the same issue, just with a trainee. She's not intellectually disabled or anything, but just super slow, and manages to do very little over time because she just stands around and chit-chats, and overthinks every task, instead of just doing it. I told her to hurry up lots of times, but to no avail. Sometimes she will try to offload tasks that she could do onto me, like taking out the trash or wiping the floors. I rarely see her take out the trash or wipe the floors herself. Usually it's me or the other co-workers doing it, because she just doesn't seem to realize when to get things done. Boss has given her several warnings that if she wants to become employed there full time after her trainee period is over, she needs to become significantly more efficient. I'm not sure she will, and Loki wishes she doesn't become a full time worker. I Love Wildwood says, Former job coach for people with disabilities here. 
There's government-funded programs that help people with disabilities maintain employment, and they can have job coaches come in to work with someone on increasing pace, building a routine, and other things like that. I recommend talking to your manager about your concerns and see if they can help her connect with your state's vocational rehabilitation program. Il the Dinosaur asks, does she officially have a disability? OP replies, the owners gave me a heads up that she has this disability, so I assume it's an official diagnosis. Have you considered letting her fail? Stop doing the work of her as well. Your employer put this on you, it's not your fault. It's their problem they hired this person, not yours. OP replies, I don't want her to get fired because she's really nice and is otherwise a good co-worker. I just keep holding out hope that she gets things figured out. She's been here since February. And now, on to the update. A little while back, I made a post about how I hated working with my intellectually disabled co-worker. The gist of it is that whenever she worked with me, I would end up doing a lot more work than normal just to keep the bakery going, and I would end up frustrated and annoyed. What I left out was the fact that this co-worker is incredibly kind and good-natured, and while she doesn't do her job well, she is a great person that myself and my other co-workers like having around. We have grown incredibly fond of her, so I don't want to have her fired as frustrating as she is. At the time of making the original post, I had very little knowledge about disability services and what that entails. A plethora of individuals with disability knowledge came out of the woodwork and informed me of a few things. One, my boss is likely getting a tax break for having her work here and is getting a portion of her income federally subsidized. Two, she should have access to vocational programs to help her develop job skills. And three, based on my description of her working, my boss has totally mismanaged her. I was under the impression that if I spoke up about how poorly she was doing at work, this sweet disabled girl would lose her source of income and end up homeless, hence why I've been spending the last five months or so burning myself out and getting frustrated to pick up her slack instead of telling my boss about her performance. For some reason, a lot of people couldn't seem to grasp this, and were incredibly condescending and unhelpful by saying things like, just let her fail, or communicate like an adult. Aside from those comments, there were a lot of helpful ones that assured me that I will be able to talk to my boss about this, and probably get her into a better position in the bakery. So I did. Today was her first shift back since I talked to my boss about this matter. She came in later than usual, did the dishes, swept and mopped the floors, chatted with us a bit until the afternoon rush happened, grabbed a donut, and left. That was it. No food had to get thrown out, there was nothing put out late, everything went smoothly, and she is still making money and socializing with us. Thank you all for your support and info. In the comments, nextend4696 says, This is a nice update. I didn't post, but I was shocked when I first found out about the supported wage in my country, and I felt like it unfairly takes advantage of vulnerable people who complete work that quite frankly no one else wants to complete. Often it's repetitive and mind-numbingly boring, and they get paid an absolute pittance. It's sad. The absolute pittance part is garbage, but what is repetitive and mind-numbingly boring to you may be the limit of what some people can reasonably achieve. Also, my daughter is autistic. She enjoys those tasks. For her, knowing what to expect is soothing. Our next post is by user NoDirt6358, titled, Am I the asshole for telling my wife to stop being a pushover or I would take away her spending privileges? My wife, 25 female, of 5 years, has a sister, 20 female. She's somewhat disabled, and while this may sound contradictory, she has a condition which makes working difficult, but not entirely impossible unless she is under stress. Neurological condition, loses muscle control, makes her hit and throw stuff slash fall over. I have no problem with her sister. She is sweet and nice to have around. My wife loves her more than anything. She basically raised her and stepped in when her parents wouldn't or couldn't. This has led to a relationship closer to mother-daughter. My wife would constantly be paying for stuff for her sister, and this made sense to me when she was a minor and was doing much worse health-wise. Recently though, this has been increasingly getting under my skin. I am the sole provider for my household right now since my wife was pregnant and only gave birth recently. We'd spend a lot to buy her gifts for holidays, which she would never return the favor, even with something cheap with thought or no thought put into them. 
We'd always take her out to events or dinner and pay for her every time. She would never even pick up the bill for herself. Again, this wasn't entirely an issue until she became an adult, and now I'm fed up with it. She expects my sister to do things like pay for her to go to the doctor, or invites us out to lunch, and then expects us to pay. She doesn't even schedule her own appointments. My wife takes her whenever she asks, even if she has the ability to do it herself, and we live 45 minutes away. She always talks about how she's freelancing and is making money, but then somehow has no money whenever she wants or needs anything. I did not have an issue with this either, really. I thought my wife was being a pushover, but it's ultimately her money. That is, until recently. Now she's spending my money on her, and it's really getting me angry. I want to spend my money on my daughter, but we're spending money on this financially irresponsible leech. I explained this to my wife in a much nicer way, but we ended up in a fight where I called her sister some pretty messed up things. I ended the conversation by telling her that I would take away her access to our joint bank account until she contributes again if she doesn't tell her sister to grow up and that she is not her mother and she is no longer a child. She cannot be dependent on people forever. I think it's an important lesson for her to learn. If she doesn't learn it, she can get back to work and continue supporting her until she's 40 with her own money, not mine. She honestly thinks that this is an end of the world situation. I think it's quite clear that this is for the better. I think she's scared of hurting her sister, but at this point, she's crippling her by allowing her to do nothing. Edit, I should have worded it better in my post. I just meant having the debit card and using our money on her sister. Not taking away all her access to money, but setting a limit, or giving her cash so she can't just get suckered into paying for stuff. A lot of the criticism still stands despite this, but I want to clarify that I'm not taking away her access to all the money entirely. I also understand the comments about my wife being a homemaker means that she is putting in equal work, so my money is her money. But we're on a single income and we can barely afford our family's needs. I can't give her half my salary so she can spend half of that on her sister. A majority of it goes to keeping us paycheck to paycheck right now. I guess my opinion on the situation is that Regardless of how Opie is trying to spin this story, it does seem as though he is being financially abusive in the situation. If Opie wanted his wife to slowly win the sister off, this should have been a process that was initiated months or years ago in order to gain favor with her, but as soon as she's pregnant, out of job, he just dumps this on her? That's not fair, that is bulldozing, that is steamrolling, that's really rude. And I'm gonna have to say you're the asshole for that one, Opie. In the comments, JRM1102 says, Everyone sucks here. Oh dear, her spending privileges? I get not wanting to spend all that money on someone who seems to be almost taking advantage, but this is not how you frame this situation. Edit, OP is 24. Stop with all the comments asking. Everyone sucks here because spending should be jointly decided upon. But man, as the sole learner myself, you have an extremely concerning take on it. Cutting her off after one conversation sounds controlling to me. The relationship between wife and sister has followed the same pattern for 20 years, and you think she's going to reverse course after one talk? I understand that you have a child now, but did you have conversations with your wife about your feelings leading up to the birth of your daughter? It sounds like a switch flipped and you suddenly felt no more handouts, and then got angry when your wife didn't instantly feel the same way. I would apologize and try this conversation again, adding that your daughter, and any future children, need to be you and your wife's priority. Instead of spending money on sister, you should be setting up a college fund. With your wife, I would start to make a list of all the ways that she supports her sister, then start figuring out how to outsource it. Since she is disabled, there is likely social security money that she can apply for, and there may be programs in the community that can help her get to appointments. Set goals for getting sister independent and work towards it. You're the asshole for exploding in her face when you suddenly felt different. Your wife is the asshole for enabling her sister. Tom the Lad 79 says, In the short term, I'd have each spouse draw a cash allowance after payday. If wife wants to use hers to treat her sister to lunch or pay her sister's bills, she can. After the money is used up, no drawing from the common pot. Long term, I'd want to be sure that the sister is receiving every kind of social help that she's entitled to and qualified for. 
disability, EBT, Medicare slash marketplace health insurance, help with transport to appointments, sheltered employment slash job retraining. I'm not sure how accurate OP is when he describes her challenges, so I don't know whether it would be best to help her work towards full independence or transition her to some kind of more sustainable supported living arrangement. You're the asshole. I get why you're upset about your wife spending money on her sister, but you are using the fact that your wife currently does not have her own income because she just gave birth to your child in order to control her, which is an asshole move on a whole different level. You're the asshole indeed. This. He is controlling, it is not his money, it is their money. And he's trying to get his wife to stop being a pushover by steamrolling her. He's just changing who is bossing her around and taking advantage of her conflict avoidance. He's not teaching her how to stand up for herself or create boundaries, he's just taking over the sister's role. So this sister, that is somewhat disabled, but not entirely impossible to work, as long as she isn't under stress when she literally loses physical control and can hurt herself, is someone you have no problem with and finds sweet and nice, yet a few paragraphs later is suddenly a financially irresponsible leech. Did anyone else get whiplash from this change in tone? Honestly, forget about the disabled sister, who your wife has as a dependent since before you were married. You had an argument with your wife, who recently gave birth, and you literally threatened to cut her off your joint finances if she doesn't do what you want or she starts contributing again. And that's why, for me, you're the asshole. She isn't contributing because she was pregnant with your child and is now post-labor caring for it. Please calculate how much this would cost for childcare 24-7 for the period since your child was born until the child was, let's say, two years old. Can you afford to pay this out of pocket? Because this is what your wife is contributing right now to your household. Posted by user TalcoBH, titled, My girlfriend, 30 female, is mad at me, 27 male, for not wanting to put her name on the title of the house. I have been dating my girlfriend for the last 10 months, and things have moved very quickly to say the least. We started living together about one month into the relationship, first at my condo, and now at her mum's house. Our relationship has been great overall, and we both love each other a lot, although my parents disapprove because they are worried they are after me for my money. I am a physician, and she works in a fairly low-paying and unstable field. Around five months into the relationship, my girlfriend and her mum started looking to buy a house for us because they felt that we were ready to get married. For me, I felt that we were moving too quickly, but I couldn't think of any reason why I didn't want to marry her, because she is so caring and sweet, and I am happy with her. Anyhow, so I was initially hesitant to jump to buying a house with my girlfriend so soon, but they were saying that the house prices will go up in the future, and that they had found a plot with extremely good land and future value where we could build a home, so I decided to go along with it. We just recently finalized the purchase agreement, though don't officially own the title yet until the house is fully built, so far, we've only had to make the down payment of 20%, which amounts to about 203000 since the house is worth $1.1 million. Because of her unstable income, and she was in quite a bit of debt, I ended up having to make the entire 20% down payment, which took a 130 k loan from my parents and 20 k from my own bank account. It was a pretty stressful process, to be honest, and my girlfriend didn't help much. She was playing games while I was asking her how I can pay for this down payment and didn't really offer to contribute at all. I put the title of the house in my name because I felt that I had contributed all the money to it. She wanted to have her name added to the title. At first, I promised her I would add her name and we would split the house 50-50 without thinking. But then I talked it over with my parents and close friends and they advised me to keep the house under my name since I had put all the money in and since we weren't yet married. They urged me to discuss this with my girlfriend as soon as possible, which I did tonight. It made me realize that I hadn't really considered what would happen if we broke up, and since we had been cohabiting for the past several months, we might be labeled as common law, which means she could claim 50% of the house. When I mentioned it to her, she got extremely upset, saying that I was being very selfish and cold-blooded, and that I was questioning the future of our relationship. This was not the case at all, but I just wanted to plan for the worst-case scenario, I guess a part of me still fears being taken advantage of. 
She started crying, and then her mum came downstairs and basically scolded me for two hours, saying that I should not have brought this up, and that I shouldn't have listened to my friends or my parents, because they are not always acting in my best interests, and wanting to break us up. I was very taken aback by this, as I felt that she was attacking my friends without even knowing them. She made a point of saying that I shouldn't learn from my friends. She then said me bringing up the title of the house was done in a very hurtful way, and she said that I didn't have enough love in my heart, that I was thinking in such calculating ways. I told her that it's easy for her to say that when they haven't put any money into it and rely solely on me to pay for the house. I mentioned that it was inconsiderate of them to start shopping for a house when they didn't have a solid plan for how to pay it off, except for relying on me. She and her mom told me that in Chinese culture, the husband is supposed to buy the wife the house. I pointed out that we weren't even married yet, and she said me bringing this up meant that I wasn't planning to marry her at all. That she said we were basically married because we were living together, which didn't make logical sense to me. Then she tried to guilt trip me by bringing up how I was living in their house rent free for the last few months, and I told them that it was not the same as buying a $1.1 million house. They kept insisting that it was the same principle, and that I should give to them what they have given to me without thinking about fairness or equality, since we are a family, even though we aren't even married yet. I guess deep down, I do still have reservations that there is a small chance that they may be conspiring to use me for my money based on the fact that they have been struggling financially, and my girlfriend has not had a stable job, and that they seem quite eager for us to get married and have kids, and buy this house all within one year. I've expressed my concerns about moving too fast, and they were always quick to discredit the opinion of my friends and family, and claim that I should only listen to myself or them. They just keep asking me, what are you waiting for? And won't accept my answer of, I don't know, I just need more time. Her mom told me that I won't ever find someone better, and that I need to put a ring on it right away. Of course, I cannot discuss my trust issues of the money with them for obvious reasons. I am feeling a bit gaslit here, but I also feel like I could just be being cold-blooded and selfish for thinking about money and not love. Right now, I'm torn between feeling like I'm being overly paranoid and selfish and insensitive by bringing up who owns the house or whether I'm being manipulated or gaslit. Would appreciate an unbiased opinion here. Thanks. Honestly, OP, it sounds like they are steamrolling you and not giving you any space to breathe. Me personally, I would walk away from this. The fact they keep insisting that you don't talk to anyone else, you don't get any information or guidance from other people with a lived experience, is just an incredibly red flag, is it not? I don't know about you, but if it were me, I'd be getting the hell out of that relationship. In the comments, Spicy Coconut Leaf says, I wouldn't put her name on the house or anything else for now, especially after just dating for 10 months. Her mum and her seem very suspicious though. Proceed with caution. Yeah, OP, in this case, I'd go with your gut. Your gut is telling you that you are not ready to get married yet. Listen to it. And yes, it's definitely suspicious of them to pressure you into buying a house with your own money and have it titled to the both of you. I suggest you move out immediately, as they are using that against you. If you still want a relationship with her, explain to her that you both should take your time and ask her why you need to get married so soon. Yes, you love each other, but isn't that reason enough for her to trust you that you'll marry her eventually, when both of you are ready? You emotionally, and she financially? This seems like some sort of scam, or she's a complete lunatic. Not sure which is a better option. OP replies, When I tell them that none of my friends got married within one year, they say all of their friends got married within a year, and some even three days after meeting. They say that there is no right or wrong timeline for getting married, and seem to glorify getting married early as indicative of deeper feelings. I can't help but feel slightly manipulated and gaslit that they are discounting the experience of my friends and family. Bruh, you are being gaslit and manipulated. You sound naive. You are the one who decides when to marry, because if anything happens, you will be screwed financially. Your marriage is not for your girlfriend or her mum to decide. They are pushing this too much, and it is starting to sound like they are after your money. And now, on to the update. Hey everyone, just wanted to update you all on what happened. So my original post was regarding me and my girlfriend buying a house together, and her getting upset that I didn't want to put her name on the house title. 
As a brief summary, my girlfriend and I have been together for 10 months and started to look around for houses after about 6 months together. But our relationship had moved very fast and we moved in together after one month. So we've spent more time together than some couples that have been together for two or three years. Not sure if this matters though. I have a very stable, high earning job and she was initially earning a lot when we first met. But fairly soon after she had to change careers and now her income is very unstable. We found a plot of land to build a house worth 1.1 million, I put all the money down on the down payment, though my girlfriend's mum promised she would contribute 300k. A discussion with her about the rights to the house caused her to feel hurt, and then her mum intervened and said some very manipulative things. I reminisced about our relationship. The good. She is extremely sweet and caring 99% of the time. When we first met, she bought me an iPhone and would buy me thoughtful gifts all the time, even later when her finances were not doing well. She is also extremely affectionate, and even now always displays her affection to me, even when I'm not paying attention. Some have said that this is love bombing, though it's been consistent throughout the entire relationship. That 1% was her being upset or frustrated, and her tone of voice would be condescending or disrespectful, though we were always able to settle our disagreements very quickly. She was, and still is, a very reasonable person to talk with, and I feel like we can work together as a team to solve problems. She is very emotionally mature, and often knows me better than I know myself. I have learned so much by being with her, and feel I've become a more caring person, and in some ways, more confident and capable. She is very thoughtful, and always remembers the little things about me. She remembers all of my favorite snacks, and buys them every month, until recently when finances were a struggle. Overall, when I was with her, I felt happy and full of love. We were basically inseparable. I took a trip with her recently and made unforgettable memories. The bad. There were a number of red flags. Our relationship moved very quickly. We moved in after one month of seeing each other. We were spending all day, every day together, and with no boundaries. She had planned out opening up a clinic with me, as the doctor at the clinic, with a 10-year rental contract, which I would be locked into and responsible for paying overhead. I learned soon after we started dating that she was making a lot of money by working for this wealthy doctor who had a romantic interest in her. She cut off all personal contact with him after meeting me, though continued to work with him professionally even after he confessed to her for two months. She told me she worked with him until she could find alternate jobs for her friends who worked under her, but it was still suspicious. That said, she never hid anything from me, and I always felt that I could ask her anything about this. My parents have said for months that they didn't trust my girlfriend or her mom, based on their words and expressions and red flags as above. Not to say that they've always been right, but they do always have my best interests at heart. She told me very early on, about two to three months in, that she knew that I was the one, and wanted to spend the rest of her life with me. She wanted to get married, but said she would wait for me whenever I was ready. While this felt nice, I also felt it was suspicious she was so ready to commit after only a short amount of time. She has always been a very headstrong, confident person who didn't question her decisions. Also, she isn't keen on doing housework and will feel tired just from cooking for a few days or washing some dishes. After reminiscing and then sitting at home alone, my heart felt empty without this person. I couldn't reconcile the person I knew and loved from who she could be on the inside, if she really was after my money. I texted her that we should break up, and then found a time in person to talk and exchange our belongings. I brought up all of my concerns and told her that I simply cannot trust her anymore. To her credit, she was very respectful and gentle. It was difficult for me to face her, especially as she was extremely tearful and looked like she hadn't eaten or slept in two days. Despite this, she kept a loving smile on her face. On the surface, she seemed genuine. This is how the discussion went. I told her that her mom was extremely disrespectful to me, especially saying that I shouldn't listen to my friend's advice, and that I was selfish and cold-blooded to bring up the issue of the house title and rushing me towards marriage and kids. She told me that her mom was just very upset that I brought up the issue because in Chinese culture, it is considered very rude to sign any contract or separate out individual rights when it comes to property that is going to be a marriage home. She also said that her mom expected us to be married by the end of the year and so felt that the house ownership was a non-issue and was just hurt that I mentioned having a plan in case we break up when to her, breaking up was not a possibility. 
Since she had invited me to live in her home, it meant she already saw me as her son-in-law. Since she was hurt, she said hurtful things without thinking. She also said that her mum was rushing us towards marriage and kids because her mum's health was not very good. History of cancer, and felt very unwell, but was afraid to get checked, and didn't think that she had much longer to live. She didn't want her daughter to be alone in this world if something were to happen to her. She also said her mom had heard bad things about this friend of mine who gave me the advice to have this conversation. Since I told my girlfriend that this friend of mine had cheated on his ex-girlfriend, then gotten together with that girl, so her mother felt that my friends were a bad influence on me. She told me herself that she never rushed me with marriage or kids, which is true. And it's true that she told me she didn't even like kids in the past, but wanted them because I did. She said we could get married whenever I was ready, even if that meant she had to get a stable job first. I told her that I was very stressed about making the down payment on the house, and I had brought this up with them, and they said they didn't have any money at the moment to help. To be fair, her mother helped me get an extension on part of the down payment, 53000 out of the 203000 by talking to the builder, but expressed no intention to pay any of the down payment. She said she asked me whether I had the money to make the down payment, and I said that while difficult, I did have the means to do so. And she said she fully intended to honor her mum's promise to pay 300 k towards the mortgage, but the money was not ready yet. She also said that if it meant getting back together, she would be willing to take money out to pay for half of the down payment. I told her that it was too little too late, and that her previous actions suggested she had no intention to pay at all. I asked her why they started to look around for houses before they had gotten my agreement, and they said that at the time they were just browsing the market without an intention to buy. At the time, I was on board with the decision to buy a house, though we didn't discuss any concrete plan for how we would split the mortgage in the future. Also, since her mother had voiced about her culture that it was a customary for the husband to buy the wife a house, I was concerned they wanted to put all the burden of paying for the house on me. I expressed that I felt unsupported by her during this time. She said she did ask me if I would be able to pay the mortgage in the future and showed me some calculations of the future mortgage. I told her that it would be difficult and I may need her help, and she said that she would help out as much as she could, but it wouldn't be 50-50. I was okay with that. However, I told her that based on the fact that they didn't help me with a down payment, and she doesn't have a stable job right now, I could not count on her to contribute to the house in the future. She promised me she would look for a stable job in the next few months, and that we didn't need to buy a house if I didn't feel ready. Through it all, she was very tearful and seemed genuine, and I was almost swayed. She brought up all of the good memories we had, and soon enough, I couldn't hold back my tears. Both our places were filled with the memories of things we had done and bought together. She told me she respected my decision, and told me she hoped in the future I would trust my heart and not let others, family and friends, make decisions for me. We both wished each other the best in the future, and we parted ways. It was kind of open-ended, but I did not say that there was no possibility of getting back together in the future. She told me she would wait for me if I ever changed my mind. Afterwards, I went home to my parents' house and analyzed everything that had been said, and all came to the conclusion that even though there was a chance I was wrong, and I just let go of someone who truly loved me with all of their heart, that there were too many red flags for me to ever fully trust her again. Also, this was the second time I had discussed breaking up with her. The first time was due to opening the clinic after three months, which she agreed to not do anymore, so I gave her another chance. So I felt there was no returning from this. Also, my parents reassured me that I am still young and have lots of opportunities, so no need to dwell too much on the unknowns. In the end, I feel that I made the right decision, although I'm lying if I say I didn't have any lingering doubts. Thanks for reading. In the comments, Jen5872 says, FFS, no, you don't buy a house with someone you've only been dating for 10 months. You don't move in together after one month. You don't buy a house you can't afford on your own. If your girlfriend's mom has to ship in, the house is out of your price range. I think you did the right thing ending it, considering everything, but geez, you really need to be more careful in how fast you move your relationships along. Take your time. Be a believer in your instincts. From the beginning, this woman and her mother tried to control you and bind you to her financially in a number of ways. You made the right choice to break up, but how about the house? Can you handle the costs or do you need to get out of the contract? And OP replies, 
I could handle the costs, though it would still be a pretty big burden on me. I think I would rather lose a portion of my deposits, 150k so far, rather than double down on the sunk cost to buy the house. Ideally, I will try to get the entire deposit back, but even if I don't, with my salary it's not the end of the world. An expensive lesson, but I'm glad that I dodged a much bigger bullet. Can you maybe have some roommates to offset costs? OP replies, if I could, that would be amazing, though I don't know if any of my friends would be keen to take on that risk. Could try, but I'd rather try to get my deposit back. It's only been two days since I gave the deposit. Damn bro, you should probably be in some real estate or legal subreddits to see if you can get your deposit back. That is a lot of money. Generally, you have contingencies or something that let you get your money back. And if you can't get your money back, I wonder if moving forward with the purchase and selling it later might be an option. And OP says, If I can't get any of the deposit back, then would probably be better to build it than sell it, hoping the sale amount would be less than the 150k difference from the purchase price. Worst case scenario, it could be a house upgrade for my parents. Honestly, what an absolute nightmare of a situation that one was, but I'm happy for you that you managed to escape, OP. Not everyone makes it out of these situations like you have, and it's very easy to believe the lies that are being spewed to you from someone that you're supposed to love and trust, and their family members. And yeah, I do hope that you get that deposit back, because goddamn, that's a lot of money. Anyway guys, what do you think about that one? I would love to know in the comments down below your thoughts and opinions. Our next post is by user Fair is Fair one titled... Am I the asshole for not letting my sister-in-law hold our baby? My wife and I just brought home our beautiful baby. When we got home, I wanted my older son to hold the baby, as he is 14. But my wife said no. She said she wasn't comfortable with anyone but us holding the baby yet. I wasn't happy about this, but I respect that, as a mum, she's anxious about how vulnerable our baby is. So I let it go. Yesterday, her sister came over and wanted to hold the baby. I said no, that my wife and I aren't comfortable with anyone but us holding him yet. My wife then said that it was fine, that her sister was a special case. I said no, that I wasn't comfortable with it. Her sister was offended and left. My wife is angry with me and says that I was an asshole to her sister. I think I'm just being consistent. Was I an asshole to my sister-in-law? OP has offered the following explanation for why they think they might be the asshole. I wouldn't let my sister-in-law hold our baby. I might be the asshole because I only said no because she said no to my son holding him. I'm gonna go with no because it is being consistent. Uh, it doesn't seem as though there's any threat that the 14-year-old poses to this baby, and it doesn't seem as though there's any specific reason that the sister is a special exception. I honestly don't know what the hell your wife's deal is with your son, but maybe that needs to be sorted out. Not the asshole. In the comments, Oaks and Pines 1776 says, Not the asshole. Thank you for standing up for your son. He is 14, not a toddler. The day prior she was not comfortable, but is now it's fine for her sister? Is son both your child or a stepchild? OP replies, He is just my child. Well then your wife is a massive asshole. Don't let her start a rift between siblings this early. Half-siblings can love each other just as much as full-siblings, but not if mum is constantly pushing one away. Don't let her do this to your son. This. I'm a half-sibling, and my oldest brothers were the first ones to hold me when my mum took me home. Don't let her poison your kids against each other. Same for me, but I was the older brother in my case. I wouldn't give that memory away for anything. I love my little sister over everything. Quote, my wife is angry with me and says that I was an asshole to her sister. Well, by that logic, she is an asshole to your underage son. Not the asshole, but ask your son if he has ever had any weird situations with her. Not the asshole. Your wife can't make one rule for some and not for the others. Well, technically, yes, you can make different rules for different people, but I think I understand the point that you're making about being consistent. If someone demonstrates that they cannot be trusted to follow instructions, regardless of age, they can and should be barred from contact. That means siblings, grandparents, and everyone in between. OP's wife made a unilateral decision that only the parents can touch the baby. Okay, that's the rule, until it wasn't, since family. Not the asshole. 
What was the reasoning given that her sister was a special case and your son, who needs to bond with his new sibling, is not? I'm presuming by unattractive interference about her, possibly that your wife is not your son's mother. This is the part where I wonder how she treats him when OP isn't there. I bet she tells the kid stuff and treats him as an other, and it'll get worse now that her real child is here. Posted by user CloudChild, titled, Am I the asshole for telling my mother I don't want her at my wedding? I, 21 female, am getting married to my fiancé next week. My fiancé, 23 male, let's call him Wesley. My mother since I was a child has had severe OCD, which came along with being a huge germaphobe, such as making me wash my hands and feet three times with a Dove soap bar, nothing else or they're not clean, any time I got into the house like water, soap, lather and rinse, three times in a row in front of her. Even if I just stepped outside for a second, you had to wash. Understandably, it is a bit of a pain, but I love her and she can't help her condition. Another thing, at 11pm every night she has to walk around the house and flick each light switch 10 times and then disinfect each and every switch because she touched them. She's been very accepting of Wesley and treated him like he was her own son, cooked for him, let him stay, and generally is just lovely. When I told him about the washing hands and feet thing, he was also very understanding and applied the method. Last year, I told my mother about the wedding, and she was very happy in the beginning. Up until after we started making preparations, she started telling me what to do. For instance, for the venue, me and Wesley planned to go to this beautiful place that had ruins of a castle next to the sea during the summer, we had only an hour slot for the ceremony, to which after we would have to be moving to a hotel to have a meal and a dance. My mother advised me to change the venue because she didn't like the fact that we chose somewhere outside for the ceremony because no one would be clean. I argued that it's what we wanted and that it's our wedding, not hers. She then went silent about it for the following time after that and never mentioned it. When choosing my wedding dress, I invited her along and she argued with me that other people have been in them so they're not clean, and then forced me to not even wear the wedding dresses, just to have the assistant hold them up in front of me. My wedding is now next week, and yesterday my mother called me and asked for me to change the venue as there will be no sinks so people could wash their hands and feet, to which I replied, I'm not having over 70 guests individually wash their hands and feet three times especially with the slot that we have, it would take a huge chunk of everything. She started yelling at me that everything will go wrong, and that she's disappointed in me because I should know the rules. I refuse to change my venue, as it would be difficult to find another in such a short time, and me and Wesley have wanted this place for a while. She told me she will sort something out, and a few hours ago, she sent me a screenshot from eBay of someone selling five tanks of water from the little water dispenser things that you would usually find in an office and a box full of Dove soap from her cupboard. I rang her up to inform her that I think it's best if she didn't attend, as the wishes she wants are impacting my wedding. She ended the call without saying anything, and then posted on Facebook that I was no daughter of hers, and that I didn't love her. Am I the asshole? I don't think you're the asshole, OP. I think that you're just between a rock and a hard place, and unfortunately, you cannot give in to the demands of your mother, and with that being said, it's probably best that she don't attend the wedding. I don't think you're an asshole for not enabling these destructive attitudes caused by her OCD. I think it's a very unfortunate uh, thing that has to happen, but I think for everyone's sanity, it's best that you continue on the path that you're going down. Not the asshole. In the comments, Joe0306 says, Not the asshole at all. You cannot ask guests to buy into this. A friend of mine has a daughter with quite extreme OCD. She always told me that when they do things like exposure therapy, you were told not to enable the behavior. I know you love your mum, but you need to stop doing the hand and feet washing. You aren't helping as much as you may want to. Does your mum have any professional help to manage this? If not, please look at getting her some help. OP replies, she hasn't ever had help, and has refused it after me and my father recommended it for her. She just shrugged it off multiple times and said that it was basic hygiene. After this, we're looking at whether she likes it or not, because it's ruining her mental health. There are four rules in abnormal behavior, and deviating from social norms is one of them. 
causing herself and others distress is another, a third is dysfunction, which means it disrupts her life. The fourth D is dangerous, and she's probably okay on that. So she has three out of four signs of abnormal psychological behavior. Also, I have OCD. It's her responsibility to treat it. If she refuses to believe she has a problem, it will be most helpful to her if you insist she get help. There are medications now. Look up fluvoxamine that help. It's not her fault that she has OCD. It is her fault that she isn't treating it. I'm sorry you have to go through this, and I hope you have a lovely wedding. Not the asshole. Your mum has an extreme case of OCD and should consider getting some help. I'm with you. She could have had help years ago to help her OCD, which I believe is a form of mental illness. There is medication and therapy. OP, not the asshole. Yes, OCD is a mental illness. I was diagnosed as a teenager with it and can say that yes, she is a bad case of it. Everything listed here are things that she needs to do, but at the same time, she needs to know herself enough to realize she needs help. I'm currently looking into texture therapies to help with the panic with certain textures on my skin that cause panic attacks. OCD is tough and will affect literally every part of your life if you let it. OP, not the asshole. But your mama needs help. The stress she feels when she can't do her routine is mind-blowing, but that doesn't mean the world caters to her because of it. And now, on to the update. Hi everyone, hopefully you've seen my original post, you might find it on my profile. Here is the update to those who wanted it. The wedding was yesterday, I absolutely had the best time of my life and have made the best memories. I took people's advice and I had told my friends, bridesmaids and maid of honor, about the situation to which they helped me create a zoom link that one of my friends would host for her to watch. I sent her this link early in the morning so she could see it in time for the ceremony at 5pm. She left this on read. She never attended the call. We noticed 6 of 7 people had cancelled last minute, to which when they were questioned by other people who knew them as to why, they replied saying they wouldn't want to watch me get married due to how I treated my mother, influenced by my mother's out of context Facebook post. After the ceremony, we went to the hotel as planned, and then during the dance, one of my mum's friends pulled me aside and asked as to why I was so disrespectful to my mother. From this, I felt extremely guilty, but I explained my side of the story, which she didn't believe. So she then left early and whispered things to other people who noticeably left earlier. Around three left due to her gossip. During the night, I sent her photos of which people who attended took, and what I took. Of little family photos and me at the altar, walking down the aisle, a photo of Wesley crying when seeing me in a wedding dress, she left these on red. Highlight of my night was my dad telling me my mother tried to give a wedding gift, but he checked what was in the box before he came, and it was a bar of dove soap, so he just left it at home. Made me chuckle a bit. After the wedding, me and Wesley stayed a night in the hotel we had the party and meal in, and I received a text from my maid of honor of a screenshot of a Facebook post my mother had made, a quote she posted, I've attached. Then, when I go to check this Facebook post, I see she has blocked me off Facebook, so that I couldn't even see her profile anymore. This was the final straw, so I texted her a long paragraph, basically saying how I love her, but she needs psychiatric help and therapy slash meds, I also said how the Facebook posts were unnecessary when we both know I retracted the invite as I was looking out for her, not because I didn't love her. Additionally, I said whether she realized it or not, she was losing me as a daughter, and it didn't have to be like this. I also said it is now her choice to take the help she needs or not because I can't force her to improve her own mentality. She has left this on red too. This situation has been taken way too far, but I can't and will not enable and feed into her compulsions and obsessions anymore. I love her, but I can't take this behavior anymore. Thank you for your support. I am very grateful for all the advice. I have had a great wedding and felt like a princess. You're all so sweet. Thank you. In the comments, out of curiosity, do your mother's friends know about her stuff? Like, do they have to go through the triple washing, or do they never meet in person? Or is she actually able to avoid inflicting this on people other than you? 
No scenario reflects well on your mother and or her friends because either your mother is capable of not being that disruptive and chooses not to give you that courtesy, or her friends are comfortable just buying into her mental illness and expecting everyone else to bend their lives out of shape for her. This is my first thought. Anyone close to her should be aware of these compulsions. I worked with someone with OCD and it was obvious after getting close to her. I don't know how someone can be a friend and not see these compulsions. OP replies, Hi. They know she has OCD, but not the triple wash, as they've never come inside our home. Basically, they don't really know of any of her behaviours and obsessions. She doesn't really get many visitors, that are her friends, due to where she lives being so far into the countryside. They really pity her for her OCD. So when she made that Facebook post about me not inviting her and how I didn't love her, her friends automatically assumed I was a horrible person and defended her. Maybe suggest that they pay her a surprise visit at her house. Entertaining guests really helps take her mind off things and gives her emotional support. Oh, OP, I read your original post and I'm so glad that you've updated us. You were totally in the right to uninvite her to your wedding, because what she wanted is quite frankly unhinged. I hope she can look at herself, reflect, and see that she needs therapy. I am so glad that you had a wonderful day and a beautiful moment with your husband. Let your mum sulk. Congratulations. I'm so glad you had a great wedding, and I'm so sorry that your mother is so far gone in her disorder that she can't see that she needs help. It's sad that she couldn't attend, but you are absolutely validated in not having her there. It would likely have turned into a chaotic nightmare for you all. Honestly, it's hard not to agree with that. I think it's for the best that the mother didn't attend the wedding, and if she were to attend, I think she might have ruined, or most likely, would have ruined the day for OP. But at the same time, the friends would have seen uh, just how bad the OCD is in person. So kind of a damned if you do, damned if you don't situation. But I'm happy that OP had such an amazing wedding. Congratulations. I'd love to know what you guys think of this one down in the comments below. Our next post is by user mpage0311, titled, I do not want to be with my husband anymore, but I'm not strong enough to tell him. First time posting, so I apologize for any errors. My, female 31, husband, male 40, have been together for almost 9 years, married for 3. When we first got together, everything was great. We were always doing something, always together, we were happy. Ever since we've been married, and if I'm being honest even before that, I have not been happy. We are complete opposites, and that used to be okay. Over the years though, I have started to resent him for how he is. We went from spending all of our time together to no time at all. You see, he's very much into video games. If he is not at work, then he is gaming. When he first started gaming, I was okay with it, as I do know everyone needs a hobby or an outlet. Pretty soon though, it became an obsession. I solely take care of all things related to our home and his child. I pay all bills, excluding our car insurance. I pay all expenses related to his daughter who does live with us full time until she graduates. I've tried time and time again to get him to see that I cannot do everything alone and that I should not have to. He tells me he will do better and he does for a week or so and then we are back into the routine that we were before. I am so mentally exhausted that I feel I just cannot be in this relationship any longer. I did try and leave two years ago because I did hit a breaking point like I am now. He didn't take it well and stated that he was going to harm himself. His manipulation worked and I stayed. I have regretted that every day. Friends and family have been telling me for a long while now that I need to leave. I'm still young and I can start over. I just don't think that I'm strong enough. How does one get the strength to do something they know they need to do? My stepdaughter, female 16, is one of my best friends. She is an amazing kid, and I really cannot imagine her not in my life. She knows I have been unhappy. She makes comments to me constantly about her father's behavior. She's always telling him that he needs to do better. It doesn't make a difference, but I wish it did. My husband is not a bad person. He is not mean, he does not yell, he is not rude. I do love him, but not the way one is supposed to when they are married. I do not want to resent him any longer, but that is all I feel when I look at him. It makes me feel so horrible having those feelings. I know if I try and leave again, he will threaten to harm himself once more, and I just do not think I'm strong enough to not put that blame on myself. I wish I was. 
I wish that more than anything. How does one get the strength to do what in their heart they know they need to do? My unprofessional and unsolicited advice is just do it. Anyone that threatens to harm themselves if you leave the relationship is a sad and pathetic person. File for divorce, cut that person off, only talk through lawyers, and if they do it, that's on them, that's not your fault. I understand that you are not strong enough to do that, but it seems as though it is necessary in this situation. Anyway, in the comments, Mango Serpent says, Last time you were not prepared for the manipulation, this time you are. That is the difference. None of it will be easy. Maybe plan differently? Reach out to family and friends near to get some support and help. See if there are support or counselling services nearby. And keep in contact with your stepdaughter and let her know that the door is always open. He probably won't even notice if she visits you all the time, and she's almost legally an adult anyway. I would talk to a divorce lawyer before you do anything. They will help you understand what is needed to protect yourself should you divorce. It also wouldn't be a bad idea to talk this through with a therapist. Both of these things will make you feel like you were taking action and doing something without the pressure of actually having to confront your husband. Plan, get ready, mentally prepare, and then maybe you'll find the strength to do what you need to do. You can't live life waiting until something feels easy enough to do. Just do it. You're waiting for things to get worse so that it's easier to leave. That's not good for you or your husband. Realize the loving thing to do is to leave before you hate each other, without waiting for the relationship to get to the point where you care about each other so little that leaving is easy. And OP replies, you were right. For me, it's just trying to get the courage to do what I know I need to do. I understand that it's not an excuse at all, but it's just how I feel. This is your life. Do you want decades and decades of this until you die? Think about all the things you want to do. Do you want kids? Do you want to travel? Think about how staying with him affects those things. Imagine finally reaching your limit, but it's too late to do those things. How resentful and bitter you will feel. You can't set yourself on fire to keep others warm. You are worth more than kindling. You deserve more. Don't give in to his manipulation. If he hurts himself, that's not your fault. And maybe then he'll get the help that he needs to handle his emotions. OP replies, The thought of being in this cycle for the rest of my life makes me physically ill. And now, on to the update. Well, I did it. I asked for a divorce. He reacted how I knew he would and threatened self-harm. I ended up contacting the police when he stormed out of the house and started texting me his goodbyes. The police were able to locate him a few hours later and get him to the hospital for some much-needed help. He was released two days ago, and we were finally able to have a conversation like adults. He decided we will be separating indefinitely. He will be heading to stay with his dad for a few months, and then possibly moving back to our hometown to stay with his brother and be closer to his daughter. All in all, everything has worked out okay considering where it started. In the comments, Yin and Ya says, It seems like you're seeking permission and leaving it open-ended. I asked for divorce rather than indicating you will be filing for a divorce, separating indefinitely rather than permanently. It still seems to me like you're leaving a window open and you should shut it. OP, please listen to this. It's a really good first step, but you cannot allow him back in. In two years, your stepdaughter will be a legal adult and can come visit you of her own volition, so don't let her get used as a tactic against you to keep you shackled either. Good OP that you found the courage to leave this relationship. I'm glad you took the advice and called the police to help him. Now's the time for you to work on you. Go to therapy, get stronger and healthy, and then you can make the best choices for you going forward. Take the time to heal now, before you make any other decisions about the future. Hope you find healing and a good future for yourself, OP. Sending hugs. Indefinitely or permanently. Time to really define your separation. You may need to also look at the language you're using, especially the asked for a divorce statement. You didn't ask for permission, you're an adult and recognized it was time to end your marriage. Language matters. I highly recommend you go to therapy. When I ended things with my manipulative ex, he tried everything he could to get back in. He really thought that I would be having him house sit on the weekends when I was away. My narcissist addict husband. Oh, okay, sure. 
they really will do anything to get their way, and he's had you raising his daughter and caring for his needs for nearly a decade. Be prepared for massive manipulation and shut it down. Anything he does will never be your fault, ever. Those are his choices fully. Do not put his choices on your shoulders or feel guilt over his actions. There is no need to communicate with him at all other than arranging to transfer his belongings. Mediation can be handled through attorneys. Keep any conversations to text, even regarding his daughter. Her relationship with you is separate from him. He doesn't need to be involved in that. And yeah, honestly, I do hope the best for you moving forward, OP. I do hope that there is another update in the future where things are resolved and he is completely out of your life. But as for now, that remains to be seen. Anyway, guys, I would love to know what you think of this one down in the comments below. Let me know. Our next post is titled, Am I the asshole for silencing my girlfriend? I, male 28, have been dating my girlfriend Nancy, female 25, for about two months now. We met on a blind date that our friend set us up on and have been seeing each other relatively regularly since then. I'm not entirely sure if we're officially boyfriend-girlfriend, but Nancy seems to think so. Nancy describes herself as a bit of a mean girl. I honestly thought that she was joking for a while, as she's typically quite nice. However, she has an awful tendency to insult people based primarily on their appearance. These insults can happen anywhere and anytime, and can be targeted at literally anyone. Of course, she has never said these things about the person right in front of them, though. The other day, I invited Nancy to a family friends event that we were having. My mother's friend, Sarah, had just gotten out of hospital for cancer. Sarah's family and my family are very close. I've known them since I was born, and consider them to be extended family. Due to cancer and chemotherapy, Sarah no longer has hair and is very thin. Once Nancy saw her, she started smirking. I literally pleaded with her not to say anything rude, and she agreed, but told me that I was ruining her fun. Fast forward, I'm chatting with my mother, female 55, and sister, female 24. Nancy walks by and says hello. She chats for a bit before starting to make several highly offensive jokes about Sarah and her appearance. I will not repeat anything, but her jokes mainly pertained to baldness and anorexia. My mother and sister looked mortified, and so was I. I literally had my jaw hanging open for a good few seconds. Once I snapped out of it, I firmly told Nancy to stop, and that no one found her shitty sense of humor funny except herself. She got upset and said that I was being controlling and misogynistic for trying to silence her. I maintained my position and reaffirmed that her comments were insane. She got even more upset and asked that we leave. I said it would be rude for me to go, as it was still relatively early, and she ended up leaving on her own. Am I the asshole? Honestly, OP, I think you know the answer to this one. She just shamed someone for their appearance after chemotherapy and surviving cancer. I don't know how little shame this person has. I don't know if it can get any worse. I mean, she didn't go and physically assault her, sure, but goddamn, what she did is not acceptable. It's not cool. Your staying with someone like this is definitely an indictment of your character. Let's just say that. Not the asshole for trying to silence her, but maybe you're the asshole for staying with her and allowing this to fester into your home life. I don't know. In the comments, Farton Scorsese says, Not the asshole, but what exactly is the appeal of this awful person? Hot sex? OP replies, Even that wasn't that good. <laughs> Crying laughing emoji. So then, what is it? You're dating an awful person for some reason? OP says, She was very good looking, but every time she's done something like this, she has become less so. You do realize you're supporting her behavior, right? Theoretically, she probably acts like this because she's incredibly self-conscious of her own looks, and all of her sense of self-worth is tied into how good she looks. Thus, she mocks others who look worse as a defense mechanism to convince herself that she'll never look that bad. Then, if OP breaks up with her for her personality, it'll prove to her her only value is her looks, and that would reinforce her behavior. Not supporting her behavior would look like forcing her to see many therapists for a long time, but that's unrealistic. OP should tell her exactly this. See, you used to be so beautiful, but every time you do this, you become more and more ugly, to the point that you disgust me in every way. Get out of my life and stay there. Cruel, maybe. 
but maybe making this about her looks a bit will make it very clear to her how repulsive she really is. Not the asshole, but you're the asshole for thinking her mean girl comments were ever okay, for bringing her anywhere in public, and for not dumping her on the spot and throwing her out. Calling someone out on being disgustingly rude is not misogynistic. And making fun of a cancer survivor's appearance is like straight up effing evil. She is not a mean girl. OP, she's a monster. Dump her gross ass and make sure she knows exactly why you're ending things. You will be doing humanity a favor by letting someone like that know their shitty behavior has consequences. You're the asshole if you continue to subject your loved ones to this awful woman. OP replies, I apologized profusely to my mum and sister. They accepted, but my sister told me jokingly that she'll disown me if she ever sees her again. I'm not sure how much of a joke that was. I know I wouldn't want to spend time with someone that was going to bring such an awful person with them. OP says, she said she was joking, but her voice and expression was serious. I would have disowned you already for not breaking up with her by now. And now onto the update. I was complaining about you know who to my friend who introduced us on the phone. He deadass told me that he introduced us on April Fools for a reason. Posted by user this policy 4486 titled I 42 female found out he's 32 male married and I want to tell his wife. We met in 2021 through a dating app. We were both looking for something casual but ongoing, so we defined our relationship as friends with benefits. We got along so well from the start, and the sex was out of this world, possibly the best for the both of us. I was transparent from the beginning that I was separated and going through a long and ugly divorce. He said he didn't care and stressed that we are friends first no matter what, so I should ask for help if I needed it. We met once or twice a month during the week in my place, we would hang out, eat, cuddle, and talk all day. He always wore an old bracelet that said daddy, and he said that it was gifted to him as a joke whenever I asked him about it. At this point, you might be thinking, how did you not know for almost two years? But I'm just the type of person that will believe everyone until they give me a reason not to. We did take little breaks when he went abroad for a project and when I was seeing someone, but we always kept in touch and checked in on each other. One day, out of nowhere, I just felt like something was off and that he could be married. Nothing happened, and I didn't find out anything. It was purely a sixth sense revelation that I had out of the blue. And this is when I texted him, start text, me. This could sound like a strange question, but are you married? He says, well, you're right. Why do you ask? You're not going to propose to me? Question mark. I say, when did you get married? Kids? He says, a long time ago. I should have told you. I'm sorry. I say, what about children? And he says, one. When I started talking to you, I was so cripplingly lonely. We hit it off so well, and I've always enjoyed spending time with you. But I completely understand if you don't want to see me again. I reply, I've told you from day one that I only need one thing. For you to be single. You've had multiple chances to tell me the truth, but chose not to. You made me into that woman. Not cool. I don't have time for liars. How low do you have to be to lie about your own child? I feel sorry for you and your family. Don't contact me again. End text. And he never replied to my last message, as I said don't contact me again. As context, I was going through a divorce when I met him, as my husband cheated on me. He knew how much I hated cheating, and I reminded him of that again in my last message. The problem is that I am haunted by this experience, and I cannot stop thinking about it. I want to confront him and tell his wife about it, as I cannot believe he did this to his wife, what my ex-husband did to me. Is it a bad idea? Update, I've confirmed that the child is a one-year-old baby that was born early 2022, and his wife was pregnant with this baby when we first met in 2021, when he was feeling cripplingly lonely. Thought I'd add a little more context as many people are suggesting that there could have been situations beyond my knowledge that pushed him to cheat and both lie to his wife and me. Oh, and the daddy bracelet being a joke was actually true. Honestly, if I were in your situation, OP, I would just find the wife and tell her. Tell her everything there is to know and just make peace with that. In the comments, 
Lotus Blooming 90 says, I was the betrayed wife in this story a year ago. The other woman found out about me and came completely clean. Her and I are besties now. I just spent last weekend hanging out with her at her place and brought my new puppy for her to meet. We both told him to F all the way off, and he hates that we became friends. And I love that. F him. This is excellent, lol. Congrats on your new friendship. OP replies, I am sorry that you had to go through this, but I'm so happy to hear that you found a resolution that worked for everyone. Pilutus says, Nah, his wife deserves to know, just like you deserve to know. There could be others. He could be putting his wife's health at risk if he's not using protection. She's being betrayed every day. You should absolutely tell her. OP replies, This is exactly why I wanted to tell the wife as well, but I wanted to see what other people would think or do about the situation, so I don't make irrational choices. Thank you for your input. You've been the wife. You wanted to know. Curious Penguin Sock says, I wouldn't confront him because that's a dead-end road. Just let her know that you've had a relationship with her husband, but were unaware that he was married, and once you found out, you ended things. You just want her to be aware for her health. Also, I hope you got checked out as well. I'm sorry though. This really stings with everything you went through with your ex. What a jerk he is. OP replies, That's very practical and sound advice. I think approaching her by saying that I've been in the same position could help her believe me more and know that I'm not trying to break up her family or hurt her. Thanks. Yeah, just know if she does lash out at you that you aren't the issue here. He was the one who gave vows, not you. I know you know, but I wanted to say this in case it gets there, and maybe you can look back at these comments and feel better. And now, on to the update. First of all, a big thank you to everyone that offered their input on the situation. There was a lot of concern on whether I had any evidence to support my story, and whether I had his real name slash contact info. I had saved every interaction between us from day one, and also I had his and the wife's social media. I wrote to her privately from a throwaway account, explaining why I decided to reveal myself, how we met, and how it ended. I attached a few screenshots that showed our chat on the dating apps, his profile, and our last message exchange where I found out about his marital status. She blocked me after checking my messages. I don't know what happened or what will happen, but at least I know that she knows. I'm not sure if there's going to be any further development from this. Thanks again to everyone that took the time to read and comment on my previous post. Edit. I wanted to add a few more details as many people seem to think that he intercepted my messages and blocked me before she had a chance to read them. It's certainly possible, but very unlikely, unless he had her phone on him at work during the day, checking messages and blocking anything suspicious in real time. Another scenario is that he did preemptive damage control by feeding her false information and making her believe that I'm crazy and need to be blocked immediately without engaging. I have no idea if this actually happened, but if my husband did something like this, it would be a huge red flag for me. And even if I believed him now, the doubt would always be there. One thing I do know for sure is that someone read that message, and at the very least, this will be a reminder for him to stop if he intercepted, and a red flag for her if she is in denial. That's all I can really hope for at this point. Thanks for the input, everyone. I don't think I'll be doing anything further at this point unless she reaches out to me. In the comments, Asian in India says, You did well. Doesn't matter anymore what she does. She knows. And that's enough. You have more guts than I would've. Even though it was difficult, you did the right thing, OP. Well done. Good job. She probably honestly is just super embarrassed. I think that's probably how I would feel towards you if I were her. I would definitely be grateful that you told me, but I doubt you'll ever hear that from her. OP says, Thank you. It's a relief to hear that. I probably would have wanted to engage and confirm a bit more, but everyone is different. Four possibilities why she hasn't engaged. She had been made to believe by him that you were a fangirl chasing him who he had rejected. Motive, vengeance. Either she already knew or suspected, she didn't believe you. If unwilling to believe, no matter what you would have said, she wouldn't have believed you. Or, this wasn't the first time she's been contacted about his infidelity, so no more confirmation needed. And OP replies, Yes, these are all possible scenarios. 
but it really doesn't matter. I've explained why I feel this way in my post, and I hope that makes sense. The clumsy pirate says, You did the right thing, no question about it. It's probably a shock to her, and hard for her to come to terms immediately, but as another person has commented, I hope he didn't get to her first and fill her head with lies. Also, a bit off topic, but anyone wondering whether to tell the spouse or not should always tell the spouse unless something specific stops you. You never know who's planning to have a baby, quitting their job, moving across the country, etc., while their partner is cheating on them. The edit in your previous post is exactly that. This man was cripplingly lonely while his wife was pregnant and out there having affairs instead of supporting her. Shake my head. OP replies, I'm quite sure that it's her that blocked me and not him. I intentionally messaged her when I knew he'd be busy working, unless they were on holidays together and he's off work, but that's very unlikely. The photos I've sent her include his dating profile, with his pics, and the date of when we matched on the dating app. Everything was in chronological order so she could see the progression. I think it would be extremely hard for him to deny everything. It would be hard for her to face the truth initially, but hopefully she'll come around. I originally thought the child was much older due to the old daddy bracelet that he was wearing, but it was a one-year-old baby. I am trying to figure out how he had the time to travel to see me and message me for long hours as a dad of a newborn while juggling a full-time job. Shake my head as well. It's pretty much guaranteed he did preemptive damage control as soon as you cut it off. Cheaters always assume at some point they're going to be caught, so they obsess over cover stories, etc. He probably told her that some crazy lady had been stalking him after he rejected her, and even made fake dating profile accounts and probably showed his real accounts to her. If someone messages you with these, you should just block them because it's probably her. That said, no one is actually that dumb, so she's either choosing to believe it or biding her time. OP replies, I have given her enough to process, organized in a way that makes sense, but that's up to her. It doesn't really matter if he did preemptive damage control. For a wife, that is already a huge red flag. Where they take it from here is up to them. And yeah, that's where I'm going to end that particular segment, guys. I don't think there will be further updates from this point. But honestly, I think that is about as much as we can expect from this story. So I'd love to know your thoughts about this one down in the comments below. Our next post is by user WhiteMWNLover, titled, My boyfriend doesn't want to get intimate with me anymore because he finished too quick. So I, female 19, and my boyfriend, male 20, started dating around 6 months ago. Everything was perfect sexually and mentally. Then all of a sudden at the 4 month mark, he started to finish very quickly during the deed. And when I say quickly, I mean like 30 seconds. I was confused and thought that it must be a one-time thing, because before, he would last between 15 to 30 minutes with multiple rounds. I didn't really care before, but now he has completely shut off his side whenever we get intimate and just focuses on me by trying to make me finish. I also want him to enjoy himself, but I just can't figure out what's wrong. He stopped smoking about a month ago, but this started before that. I want to help him fix it, and I truly don't care, but I can tell it's making him self-conscious. I just want him to be confident again. What do I do? In the comments, Index Card Life says, Happens sometimes. I remember it psyched me out when I was a little younger than him. Now when I have a quick exit, I apologize and laugh and try again sometimes, or don't. I don't know. Depends on our mood. Girlfriend takes it as a badge of honor. Just tell him that it's fine, and he'll probably get over it eventually. But what does your girlfriend do? Because I started off that way, but after a while, I'm like, okay, this is a waste for me. I'd like to come as well here. <laughs> Lol. This happens to my boyfriend and I pretty often. He just eats me out or we grab a toy. I come every time, just not always from penetration. There's no reason an orgasm has to happen during penetration. The Elon Musk says... I am a random die roll as to whether it takes 20 minutes of work to finish or 20 seconds. It depends on all kinds of factors. Tiredness, horniness, how full I am, ad infinitum. As long as my partner is enjoying herself, then it doesn't really matter. He just needs to get over it and enjoy the moment. Same with my husband. At first it did embarrass him, but then he figured out if he gets me off first, then it doesn't matter as much how long he takes. Although when it's too long, I tend to do something to hurry him up, lol. 
So most of the time now, that's what he does. Works for us. Speaking from experience, there is every chance that this is a phase that he'll pass. You're still pretty fresh in the relationship, and it just takes one event to skew your mindset and confidence in your own performance. It can take months to get back to normal. This might not work for everyone, but going again a second time always works for me. The second time always lasts vastly longer. Might need to work out how long a break he needs though. Also, don't approach it as, don't worry we can go again, but more like, wait a bit of time and approach him and initiate yourself. He will love it. And now, on to the update. I talked to him about it in the morning, and he told me that he doesn't know what's wrong either. I reassured him, and held him, and all of that stuff, and I told him that I didn't care, and as long as I got to be with him, that's all that matters. He said that it's not that, it's just that it's embarrassing, and at this point he's scared to get intimate because he can't do anything. Our relationship is amazing. We're both extremely attracted to each other, and I really don't care about it, because every time he gets me off, but I just want him to have a good time. I just think he's so stressed to perform that he forgets what we're really doing, and that I'm not doing it for pleasure, but to connect with him. I told him this, and he literally started crying in my arms. I think we're going to try new things in the future, but I feel like he's less insecure. At least I hope, because I want him to be his best self around me. And yes, we did it after, and it was the best we've ever had, even if he lasted one minute. All's well that ends well, I guess. Glad everyone came together in the end. Am I right, guys? As always, let me know what you thought of this one down in the comments below. Our next post is by a throwaway account titled... Am I the asshole for leaving my sister's wedding early because she kept my husband out of pictures? So my, 31 male, sister Anne, 34 female, got married on Saturday. My husband of 7 years, Mark, 32 male, was there with me, and up until one point, it was an amazing evening. After the ceremony, Anne wanted a picture with all of our siblings, there's 5 of us, and their respective partners, so we started lining up. When Anne saw that my husband was standing next to me, she shook her head and said something about him ruining the aesthetic. Apparently her plan was to put one man and one woman next to each other alternately. My younger sister, 18 female, who doesn't have a partner and was standing on the very side, offered to stand between the two of us so that we could be close and Anne's wish would still be respected. I thought that was a great solution, but Anne disagreed and told Mark to get out of the picture. He is quite introverted, and tries to avoid confrontation under all circumstances, so he simply complied and told me not to get angry, but it was obvious that he was hurt and disappointed by being left out. Obviously, it didn't stop me from getting angry, and I walked away with him. I can understand that Anne wants her wedding pictures to look exactly like how she imagined, but I think that the idea my younger sister proposed was very reasonable. I congratulated Anne and her husband one last time, but then I said my goodbyes. When I was asked why we were leaving early, especially before taking the pictures, I said that I didn't feel like our presence was wanted. We left before dinner was served, and I took Mark out to his favourite restaurant to cheer him up a little bit. Anne has texted me since, saying that I was being overdramatic and making a fuss over nothing. Our parents have tried to remain neutral, but except for my youngest sister, the rest of the family supports Anne and thinks that leaving early was going too far, and that I should have just sucked it up instead of ruining her big day. Honestly, it's very obvious when you put two and two together. You're a man, you're married to a man, uh, that seems to be the only reason as to why he wouldn't be included here. But yeah, that is the reason as to why she didn't want him in the photo. It doesn't seem as though she supports your relationship. It seems as though there's some homophobia going on. Because yes, having a woman in between you guys fits the aesthetic. There would be absolutely no problem with that going by her rules. But yet, he is still not welcome. The fact that everyone else at the wedding can't see that or refuses to acknowledge that point speaks volumes about them as well. Not the asshole OP. In the comments, this will not do says, not the asshole. Has your sister always been shamelessly homophobic, or has the wedding brought out a new side of her? I admit it, I didn't even realize that was a possibility. I just saw two married people at a wedding. I was wondering if it was racism, but homophobia makes sense too. This is what I get for never looking at people's ages or genders. Not the asshole. 
She expects you to celebrate her marriage while she disrespects yours. Good on you for respecting your husband. Wow, I've never gotten an award before. Thank you all for reminding me that although there are serious assholes in this world, they are not the majority. Peace and love. Exactly, not the asshole. If she had been upfront about her dislike of your husband, you could have chosen not to come at all. Hell, she could have been even more sneaky and put him at the end and then photoshopped him out. Still very rude and cruel, but it wouldn't have put you in a position to choose her or your husband. You did exactly right. You didn't give her any ammo by flipping over tables at her wedding. Anybody who tells you differently, tell them that you want a family picture without assholes, so need to be hidden under a sheet for the next family picture. See if they think that's fair. Otherwise Painter 67 says, not the asshole. Your sister was being homophobic and you did exactly what any husband should do. You could have given your sister the option of either this compromise or we're leaving because I won't let my husband be forced out of family photos when everyone else's spouses are in it or something similar, but I doubt it would have done any good. Give your husband a hug and tell him this internet stranger is sorry that he went through this. Yes, I'm also sorry you and your husband had to experience that. If I was there, I would have walked out too in solidarity with you both. This. The whole family is full of assholes since nobody stuck up for OP and his husband. If someone pulled that shit on my brother, I would have been out the door. Posted by a deleted user, titled, I, 22 female, had sex with my neighbor, 30 male, once. Is his current behavior weird, or am I being overdramatic? I made the mistake of having sex with my neighbor. We live in the same building, and I came home from a night out about two weeks ago and met him in the hallway. We got to talking, and he invited me back to his place, we had a drink, one thing led to another, and we had sex. I have to admit, the sex was pretty awkward and bad. I'm cringing as I write this, but as we were doing it, he told me he loved me. We had spoken about twice before this night, so I got my first impression maybe he was a bit strange. I was really embarrassed by the whole thing. Thought he would be too, and not very maturely, decided to just avoid him. I thought he would get the hint that it was just a drunk one-night stand and I wasn't interested. But I kept seeing him all the time. I think he must have worked out what time I leave and get back from work because I started bumping into him way more than I used to. I kept the conversation short and acted uninterested because I thought he would get the hint and back off a little. I guess I was just avoiding that awkward conversation telling him that I wasn't interested, but in no way was I encouraging him. He persisted, and then a few days ago he added me on Facebook, which I ignored. The next time I saw him, he asked why I hadn't accepted his friend request, so I decided to be a bit more assertive and said something like, the other night was fun, but I'm really not interested in anything. He was quite upbeat and replied, okay, that's cool, but we can still be friends. So I thought maybe I had been a bit immature towards him, and now that I've told him my intentions, we could be friends. I still think he's being a bit over-friendly with me. I'm sure he's waiting to bump into me because I see him like all the time. He's also not shy about asking personal questions, like about ex-boyfriends and stuff. I get that some people are more open about things, but I find it a little weird. On Facebook, he has liked so many of my pictures. I know we all stalk people on Facebook, but he is very obvious about it. He has also messaged a couple of times asking me to hang out. My question is, is his behavior a bit weird, or am I just being overdramatic? I'm happy to be his friend, but I feel like he is being a bit over the top. I don't want to act like a bitch towards him, but I don't really know how to tell him to turn it down without coming across as one. He's someone that I'll probably keep seeing, so I feel like I have to be nice to him, but he is weirding me out a bit. TLDR, had sex with my neighbor, told him I wasn't interested in anything else, but he is very persistent in being my friend. Not sure if his behavior is a little weird, or if I'm being overdramatic. Honestly, my take on this situation is that he is being very weird, and being very immature in this situation. It's insane that you are so much younger than him, and yet you're the one stepping up to the plate and trying to end things, and he's going about it all the wrong ways. The fact that he told you he loved you when he doesn't even know you is a gigantic red flag. What is that? Run. Run from this man, OP. Get him away from you. In the comments, Let Dude Shadowban says, He literally told you he loved you. You chose to brush this off? You shouldn't have. 
because it was a red flag. He loves you and wants to get into your pants big time. He is being your friend because he thinks he can get into your pants that way. You are not being overdramatic, just oblivious to what this guy is doing. And OP replies, I only brushed it off because I thought that it was a silly drunk comment and he was literally right on top of me, so I didn't want to make the whole thing even more awkward by mentioning it. Maybe I've been oblivious, but I didn't think anyone would say that when they're having sex with someone they didn't really know. Yeah, but he did say it, so you are being oblivious. You are absolutely right that no sane, well-adjusted person would ever dream of saying that in that situation. This, and the fact that he's literally stalking you outside your apartment, is what has me concerned for you. He is not behaving like sane people do. OP replies, Okay, what would you suggest I do then? I have deleted him from Facebook and am planning on what to say when he talks to me. Say something like, I know you said you wanted to be friends, but it seems like you're hoping to be more and I don't want to give you any false impressions. I meant it when I said that I wasn't interested and I don't want to lead you on. If he insists that no, he just wants to be friends, then firmly shut him down and say, sorry, but it doesn't seem that way to me, and leave. The obvious hindsight answer is, but seriously, I think due to having sex and the fact he said he loves you probably means he's had a crush or adult equivalent on you for a while, then the sex happened, and he's probably been hit by the love bug slash stalker bug, etc. If he is a normal human being, it will subside. If he isn't, which you've hinted is a possibility, I'd at the very least let a friend or someone know the situation, just to be on that safe side and then play it by ear. Hopefully it all dies down for you though. And OP replies, Yes, hindsight is a great thing, but I have deleted him on Facebook now and hope it'll all just subside. I have told a couple of friends about it anyways, so if things get worse, they know. But honestly, I don't think he's that crazy. And now, onto the update. So I'm going to begin with the typical thanks for the advice and for those who kept telling me, yes, I've learned my lesson about having sex with someone who I don't really know and can't really avoid. Anyway, onto the update on this situation. The first thing I did was delete and block him from Facebook, but that's the easy bit because I was still going to have to talk to him in person. I coincidentally ran into him on Monday. The first thing he said to me was, have you deleted your Facebook or something? Because I can't find you anywhere. So I went for it and gave a long speech about how he's a nice guy and I thought we could be friends, but I feel like I'm leading him on by hanging out together as I'm really not interested. He replied that he really does just want to be friends and that it would be more awkward now if we're not. I just said something like, I don't want to give you the wrong impression, so I think it's best for now if we're not. And then I just quickly left before he could say anything else. I felt like a bit of a cow saying it, but I guess it needed to be said, and I'm glad I did it because he was overwhelming me slightly. So far it worked and I haven't actually seen him since then, but it's only been like two days. However, last night I got a rambling long letter through my door. It came quite late so I'm almost hoping he was drunk or something when he delivered it because I think it's kind of effing weird and also vaguely insulting. I think I'll type it out as it's difficult to explain the tone of the letter, so here it is. Dear OP, you didn't give me much of a chance to speak the other night, and there is more that I wanted to say, though this might actually be an easier way for me to explain my thoughts and feelings. I know we only had talked a few times before our tryst, but I felt like there was an obvious connection between us. I'm sure you must have felt it too, or I don't think you would have come home with me that night. I'm not the type of guy who sleeps with girls I don't really know, but I was extremely attracted to you, and when it appeared that you reciprocated my feelings, I couldn't help myself. When you told me you weren't interested in anything romantic, I understood, even if it was not what I wanted to hear. I don't know anything about your personal life. Part of the reason why I'm not usually interested in one night stands, and so of course I realize why you might not be interested in me. However, I think it's strange you don't at least want to be friends. We shared a very intimate moment with each other, and you can't pretend that it never happened. It therefore seems only logical that we become friends. It only makes it more awkward if we aren't. I just want to say, if you feel embarrassed or worried that I think view is slutty, don't be. I don't judge you. That would be a terrible double standard. Though be careful, because some men may see your behavior as slutty, especially if you refuse to talk to them after. Just like when a guy doesn't call a girl after they sleep together, he's seen as an asshole. 
Really, the point of me saying all this is just to repeat that I understand that you're not interested in a relationship with me, and I respect that. However, I'm just going to say it. I really like you. You're a fun, smart, and beautiful girl, and I would love to get to know you more. I don't think you can deny that we got along very well before that night, and I don't think what happened should change anything. Don't think that you're leading me on. I'm a grown guy, and I know that no means no, and can handle just being friends with you. But I respect what you said to me, even if it hurt a little, and will keep my distance from you for now. If you change your mind, and if you ever want to talk to me, or if you need anything, you know where I live, and I will always welcome you. That's what neighbours are for, right? Ah. <sighs> I do feel a bit bad, because he obviously does like me and has put a lot of emotional value on what happened between us, but I just don't feel like I can deal with someone as intense as him. Maybe it's just me, but I do think that his letter has confirmed that he is a bit odd, so I'm glad that I said what I said and was upfront with him. I think he will leave me alone now. He has so far, though I hope if we do see each other, we can be polite and it won't be too awkward. But it probably will. TLDR, I told him that I wasn't interested in being friends, he sent a long letter telling me his feelings, but I think he will leave me alone. In the comments, Unicorn No More says, Ugh, this guy is way too heavy, way too attached after one night of sex. The whole letter is creepy. There was no need for him to write it. OP replies, I'm glad I'm not the only one who thinks it's creepy. When I was your age, I might have written a letter like that if I were in his situation. He wants something, and he thinks words can make that thing happen. Once I was his age, I realized that words are unlikely to change someone's mind. They're only likely to seem creepy. He should know better. I don't think there is anything you can do now. Interacting with him more will only make him think that he has a chance. He's a grown-ass 30-year-old man with the social grace of a middle schooler. We have to be friends now because we shared an intimate moment. This guy needs a dose of reality. Also, OP, after that letter, I would take some precaution. It scares me a little bit. Go with your gut feeling. Something tells me there's something not quite right with this guy. This is really what I find weird. He's 30 years old and he doesn't seem to get that a one night stand doesn't equal friends and that his persistence is making it worse. I think he may be a little socially stunted. And now onto update 2. I was hopeful there would be no more updates to this because he managed to go for about a week without contacting me. I hadn't seen or heard from him for a few days, so I thought things were blowing over and he had gotten over it. Then yesterday afternoon, I was getting some stuff out of my car and I suddenly hear his voice say, Hey, do you need a hand? Of course we were going to see each other again at some point and I thought that I was polite with him by just saying, Hey, no, I'm fine thanks. I really didn't think this was rude, and I really didn't need any help anyway, but he seemed to get offended by it and started to get mad at me. He said something like, what's your problem? I'm only trying to help you. All I've ever done is be nice to you, but you still act like a beer. I think he said more, but I was kind of shocked at how he reacted. He stormed off before I could say anything, but I don't even know what I would have said as I was a bit stunned and also totally embarrassed because there were people around who probably heard it all. I was also a bit upset because I know that he is allowed to feel a bit used or whatever as he obviously liked me more than I liked him, but I do think this outburst was uncalled for. I have made my feelings clear to him now and I know the truth hurts sometimes, but I don't think he has to take it out on me like this. This morning, I woke up to another letter. This one is quite short, so I'll type it out again. Dear OP, I want to apologize for shouting at you earlier. I let my anger get the better of me, and I'm sorry about that, but I can't help but get frustrated at your behavior. I get that you're not interested in me, and that you don't want to be my friend, even if I do find it strange. I know you're aware of my feelings on this, so I won't repeat them. However, when someone is trying to help you, it is good manners to accept it, or, at the very least, be grateful. Again, I'm sorry, and I realize I need to think about the way I acted, and will try not to do it again. By the way, this is how adults deal with awkward situations, they don't pretend they never happened. I hope you accept my apology, and the little bit of advice that I gave you. Huh. Maybe I should be grateful he apologized, but I also think this letter is worse because he's not even trying to hide the insults and is totally patronizing. I don't know how to deal with him anymore. He seems to have gotten over his love for me, but now has some grudges against me. 
If he really thinks this is all about me, I don't even know why he even wants to talk to me and be friends. It must have been like a month since we had sex now anyway, so I don't know why he can't accept it and move on. I kind of want to talk to him again now, but I get the feeling that is what he wants me to do. Should I just ignore him and hope that he gets bored when he realizes I won't give him any attention? Or should I tell him again, more assertively, that I want him to leave me alone? I'm so effing stressed about seeing him again though because I don't know what he's going to be like. TLDR, he sent me another weird letter after I refused his help. I don't know what to do now. In the comments, Locke Raymono says, quote, however, when someone is trying to help you, it's good manners to accept it or at the very least be grateful. Good manners would be not acting out and calling someone a bear. Quote, hey, no, I'm fine, thanks. That is grateful. You did fine, he's a creep. I would notify your landlord that he's making unsolicited advances and you've asked him repeatedly to stop and he hasn't. Otherwise, if it were me, I'd keep ignoring him. Become a black hole where you acknowledge nothing that he does and when he speaks, writes, etc., ignore. How about when he says, by the way, this is how adults handle awkward situations, not by pretending that they didn't happen. Yeah, you know what else adults do? Leave people the hell alone when it's been made abundantly clear that's what they want. Blue Claw Crab says, save the letters, continue to ignore him. If he continues, you may have to get a restraining order. Accept that he is a nutso and have zero interaction. Agreed. I would also consider alerting the property management company and even seeing if you could move to another apartment to the other side of the complex until you fulfill your lease and can move away altogether. This. He's trying to get your attention in varying ways. Don't oblige. He does not deserve it with his attempts at manipulation. Yup. Textbook nice guy. How dare you not reciprocate his friendship? How dare you not need his graciously offered assistance? How very dare you? What an effing creep. Funny thing about nice guys is that they're actually not very nice, as in OP's situation. They snap like he did, and most, if not all, are dishonest, manipulative, passive-aggressive, terrible listeners, full of rage, and always expect something in return. Agreed. The book No More Mr. Nice Guy gives a lot of insight on this. These guys do things to get things, because they believe that that's the way the world works. Creep Magnet checking in, my expert opinion, not really, is that he's trying to draw you in any way that he can, even if it's projecting some kind of imaginary behavior to you, accusing you of being rude. He is totally desperate. You shot down sex again, and friends, so now he is desperate. He might be over his love for you, but I sincerely doubt it. He probably exerts a great deal of time carefully planning each interaction and the best way to manipulate himself into your life somehow. In his mind, friends is only a short length way away from sex. Guys like this are so scary. He currently has settled his plan on guilt. Even if you had said, yeah, a hand would be great thanks, he would have still written you a letter stating that good manners would be to invite him in for a thank you drink or a blowjob. You need to be very careful, and saying and doing nothing is the way to go. He's trying to push you to do, feel, and say what he wants. And now onto the third update. I had requests to update on what happened, so here it is. Hopefully it's the last one. Things have happened quite quickly since my last update. I was still kind of undecided whether to write to him to tell him to leave me alone, as this would give me proof if things went further or to just ignore him. Anyway, I called my brother, who I didn't initially want to tell about all this, but I thought that I should probably tell someone in my family. He was totally adamant I shouldn't contact him and I should call the cops if he continues, so I took his advice and decided to not communicate with my neighbor. I sort of regret telling my brother now because he really did not help the situation. I had been out on Friday night, and he stayed over at my friend's house, so I didn't get back until Saturday morning. I came back wearing what I had been out in, so to my neighbor, it probably looked like I'd spent the night with a guy, so this may have made him a bit more angry. He was in the hallway when I got back. I'm totally sure that he had been waiting for me, and said to me, I don't appreciate getting threatening messages from your brother. I honestly had no idea what he was talking about, so I said that, and I found out that my brother had sent him some kind of threatening message telling him to leave me alone. He then was saying stuff like, Why can't you tell me this yourself? 
Why can't you at least talk to me? I just don't understand you. I responded something like, I'm sorry about the messages. I didn't know that he sent them, but I have told you I don't want you to contact me, yet you keep sending me those letters, and I think he was just worried about me. This is when he got pretty angry and was saying stuff like, what are you worried about? And how he had just been trying to be nice. Yeah, he actually said it. He pretty much just repeated what he said in the letters, but it was the first real time he actually scared me a little. I didn't really know what to do, but then he called me an SLUT to my face, and I was like, F this, I'm not listening to you anymore, leave me alone, and went straight to my apartment. As I was walking away, he tried to backtrack and apologize, but I didn't want to give him any more attention, so I ignored him. The first thing I did after this was talk to my brother again because I was kind of annoyed at him for getting involved and I wanted to find out exactly what he said. So he got his Facebook from one of my friends and sent him this message. You need to leave my sister alone. You are creeping her out. If you don't, there will be consequences. So I guess it does sound a little threatening, but this is not as bad as I thought it might have been. Even though I was worried that my brother's message might have been seen as provocation, I decided that I was going to call the police. I waited until the next day because I was tired and it had gotten a bit late after talking to my brother. I shouldn't have been surprised that I woke up to another letter. I think he loves having the last word. It's not very long, so I'll type it out again. Dear OP, I'm sorry for some of the things that I said to you yesterday. I didn't mean them, but the heat of the moment got to me. I did feel threatened by what your brother said to me. All I've tried to do is talk to the person that I live next door to after I had sex with them. You've made it pretty clear that you were not interested in me, and I have accepted that. However, I have explained to you multiple times that I find it strange that you don't want to talk, so I think you could be more understanding to my feelings instead of just labeling me a creep. I think we need to talk like adults, in person, because I feel so frustrated that you don't understand what I've tried to say to you in my letters, and the only way to do it now is face to face. I won't let my anger get the better of me like it has previously, and surely you must see that this is a better idea than getting your brother to send me messages. Ah, <sighs> There is no way I was going to talk to him in person again, as the last two times we spoke, he just got angry with me and called me a slur and a bitch. I want the whole situation over now, so I called the police. It was the non-emergency thing, and they were actually very helpful. I was prepared for them not to care, and they asked me to go to the station, and I had to show them all the stuff that he sent me, the letters and Facebook messages, etc. They filed a report, and originally they offered to call him, but when I told them that I didn't have his number, they said they would go and talk to him. I just want to make this clear for those who responded to me before, saying going to the cops was too far, this isn't a restraining order, he hasn't been charged or anything. All I've done is file a police report, and we have both agreed to not contact each other, and if either one of us contacts each other, then it will go further. I was sort of expecting him to send another letter after this, but he hasn't. I know it's only been a couple of days, but I do feel better about the situation now. I'm going to stay here for now. I might talk to my landlord, but I don't think that he would let me break my lease. If I feel like I don't want to stay, I think my brother would help me out with money. I do feel bad about what happened, and of course I should never have had sex with him. The number one lesson I have learned is don't sleep with your neighbor. But if anyone reading this finds themselves in a similar situation, I guess my advice is trust your instinct and go talk to the cops because they can be helpful, and it doesn't mean that they're going to start arresting people. Anyway, thanks for all the advice. It was appreciated. TLDR, my brother messaged him without my knowledge, he then confronted me and got real angry. Decided to call to talk to the cops, we have agreed to go no contact with each other. In the comments, I am not your mother says, I'd also suggest saying something to your landlord about this. Perhaps let them know that you filed a police report because this guy was harassing you. Wouldn't hurt to have them simply be aware just in case you end up needing to break your lease over it. I'm a property manager, and I definitely want to know if something like this was going on. No landlord should blame someone for wanting to break their lease over it. It is also possible that this guy's lease will be up for renewal soon, and the landlord could skip renewing his. Zoe Pantalone says, quote, Number one lesson I've learned is don't sleep with your neighbor. I'm glad you're doing something about this, but I'm going to reiterate that you, and anyone else in this situation, have done nothing wrong. 
People can sleep with other people. People can no longer want to talk to other people. How you choose to react to that is on you. He should have listened to you when you told him not to contact you the first time. I agree the weirdo gets 100% of the blame for this mess, but I do think it pays to be more careful than normal when sleeping with neighbors. In this imperfect world, some people are going to be creeps, but if they don't live near you, it's a lot easier to get out of the situation. I agree. I'm personally fond of the golden rule. I just don't want her takeaway to be that this is all her fault. Creeps are everywhere. And now onto the final update. What a mess this all turned into, but I really do think this is all over now, and so I thought that I would do a quick final update. Initially I was thinking I would just try to stick out living there until my lease ended, but on the encouragement of some of the replies on my last post, I decided to talk to my landlord. He was not really very understanding, and was like, you shouldn't have slept with him, which I guess is true. He said there is nothing he can do now, but if I wanted to break the lease I could, but it would cost me two months rent as a termination fee, and I have to give 60 days notice, though he did say to let him know if anything else happens. So I left it, but I was living in like constant anxiety of seeing him, or that he would just do something else. Then I talked to my brother again, and he told me that my neighbor had been messaging him saying shit like, how does it feel to know that your little sister is a slut, and other sexual stuff. I wasn't really sure if I could go to the police again with this, because he wasn't directly contacting me, but I realized I didn't want to stay anymore. My brother agreed to help me come up with the money, so I thought that that would be that, and I could get away. Then maybe a couple days later, I ran into my neighbor. It probably was just a coincidence, it was going to happen at some point. The weird thing was he was being super friendly, and asked how I was, etc., and didn't mention any of the stuff that had happened. I found it almost creepier than when he was being aggressive, and I told him that he was supposed to be leaving me alone, and I wanted him to stop contacting my brother. He said something like, I thought we had moved past all that. This is when I seriously began to think that there is something really wrong with him, and I just told him again to leave me alone. Then, surprise, he sent me another letter. I can't find it right now, but it basically said that there was no need to contact the police before, and I hope you aren't thinking about doing it again, but the tone of it was kind of threatening. I went to the police again, and things got a lot more serious this time. I got a temporary injunction against him, then there was a hearing, and I got a final injunction, restraining order. Because of this, I was able to break my lease without the termination fee, with only 30 days notice. I stayed with a friend for a couple of weeks, but this week I have moved into a new place and finally feel that I can move on from all of this. Thanks for all the advice on here. It sure gave me the confidence to go to the cops. TLDR, he didn't leave me alone. Had to get a restraining order and have moved into a new place. In the comments, quote, I'm a grown guy and I know that no means no. Turns out that was a big dumb lie. When I read I know that no means no, my eyes threatened to roll right out of my skull. Dude doesn't grasp that consent doesn't just apply to sex, and that he's not owed being heard or spoken to. If someone tells you that they don't want to interact at all, the correct response is to not interact at all. Not persistently demand that they take in your explanations and apologies for repeated bad behavior, including refusal to respect boundaries and give you a shot. Sometimes the first impression is the only one that you get. And the way adults handle it is to accept that and move on, not whine and slip creepy effin' unsolicited communiques under people's doors. The thing about long apology letters from people who have been told leave me alone is that they think they have your attention for the time it takes to read the letter, so they keep sending them. I hope OP's neighbor realizes she doesn't owe him that. I once got this long ass email from a person like this. I deleted it without reading more than a sentence. Now years after, I sometimes wonder what was in it, but at the time it was the best decision I could have made. I was a nervous wreck after just seeing an email from this person. I got an email from my abusive dad last night, and instead of deleting it, I read it. To be honest, I was giggling and enjoying his whining and misery, because after everything he put me through, he sure earned that horrible life that he's living, but still set off the nightmares, like it does any time I hear from him, and now I'm scared to go to sleep tonight, like a total grown-up. My family tells me I'm much better about it these days though, I can actually have a conversation about him with another family member. 
for years after I escaped from him, I'd go into hysterical panics at the mere mention of him or anything about him. And it never effing stops, y'all. I'm way older than OP, and I have a whole avoid my neighbor routine when I come and go from home. He's not someone I've slept with nor ever will, but can't tell him that. I tried being clear and polite, gently rebuff and keep it light, etc., and he got rude and huffy. Is it a coincidence that nails and metal shards keep winding up in my tires? I've had them patched up four times since I've lived here, and he definitely lurks the parking lot. I don't even want to know. Just waiting for the lease to run out so I can move. Posted by a throwaway account titled, My fiancé, 27 female, is threatening to call off the wedding if I, male 26, don't let her parents move in with us after the wedding. Obviously, this comes off as a rich people problem, but up until five months ago, I was still living in a one-bedroom apartment, working at a rather large supermarket retail store, making $12 an hour, and going to be paying off college debt until I was in my 60s. My fiancé is still working her nursing job, and we've been fully living together for four years. Some background into our relationship? We met six years ago. There were literally zero issues with us dating. When it came to some sort of conflict, we sat down, explained both our sides like adults, and generally fixed the problem. We've rarely gotten into arguments and have the same end goals in life, children, grow old together, die and be buried next to each other, and have fun whenever we can. I have always had an incredibly distant relationship with her parents. When she introduced me to them, they both stated they didn't like me to my face and thought I wasn't good enough. Her father even said, not in my lifetime. When I asked for his permission to marry his daughter, which I stated the only reason I was doing it was for an olive branch. My parents, on the other hand, love my fiancé. They scooped her up like she was one of us from the start, has never said anything bad about her in public, nor have they in private. She, at least in my parents' eyes, is the metaphorical second coming of Christ. During my grandfather's decline in health, I was the first one there. He just got old, and with being old comes complications. I stopped working my higher-paying job to work retail to have more time to take care of him because his other children were busy. This was a very stressful time in our relationship. I had just recently left my job, was not around often, and I myself was super stressed. Recently, I have began the slow move of everything over there. While we still have to live in our apartment until the lease agreement is up, there is nothing against the rules of me moving stuff. I brought it up to my girlfriend how taking care of my grandfather has really made me realize how important my family is, and that I wanted to know if it was okay for my parents to move into the new house with us. My dad could retire, and my mum can spend the rest of her life relaxing, not stressing over bills and debt because I can pay that off over time. I'm not insane enough to pay it all in one go. She expressed how that was an amazing idea and how she would like her parents to move in as well. I laughed at that idea and asked her if she was serious and why would I want to live in a house with people I don't like nor want to interact with. She explained that this could be a good chance at us healing old wounds and making amends. I explained that not only do I not want to heal old wounds, if it was up to me, they wouldn't be coming to the wedding. Obviously, this was the wrong thing to say, and now she's giving the ultimatum of, let them move in or the wedding is off. And while I can understand her side, I seriously do not want to interact with them in any capacity. They have tried numerous times to get her back with exes, lie about me, and even spread a rumor about me being unfaithful until I pulled up real evidence of me being nowhere near where they said that I was thanks to Google location. My fiancé knows all of this and still wants to try and rebuild a relationship with them. This past week, I've been avoiding her with excuses and white lies. I've been meeting with accountants, lawyers, wedding venue people, and jewelers. I've also been spending all-nighters at my grandfather's grave drinking with him and not getting back home until 4am. To me, it feels like my grandfather is still the only person I can vent my deepest secrets and frustrations to. Which is why I've come to you, Reddit. I feel trapped. On one hand, I do not want to live with people I absolutely hate, and on the other hand, I do not want to lose the woman of my dreams. I want a third party's opinion on the matter, with no connection to me whatsoever, as I feel it's the best way to make a good judgement without people close to me influencing my choices. 
I'm more than willing to answer questions and know how this subreddit works because I too am a pizza reading, pimple popping redditor myself. Honestly, a very hard one to make a judgement on, but if I were in your position I'd stand by my morals and try and go further down that conversation with your partner. Obviously you don't want to lose them, but it is not healthy for you to live with these people in the same house. They will cause warfare, they will attempt to cause even more divide now that they are right there, and it seems as though they may be successful. Because if they don't live with you, they can separate you two. If they do live with you, it's more likely that they can separate you two because everyone will have to choose sides. My advice is stick to your guns and try your best to get an amicable outcome in this situation. In the comments, OK Kangaroo says, OP, have you and your fiancé talked about what ifs? What if your in-laws are toxic to your face again? What if they want to mooch off you and you have to pay for things? What boundaries has your fiancé suggested that if her parents break them, they are out? Her parents need to follow rules in your home. It seems you still have more talking to do. What if she's not good with any of that? Well then you have a real tough decision to make. Maybe it's best if you just rent out grandpas and live in the apartment for a few years. The problem with ultimatums is that they work both ways. It's a good thing about the prenup because it sounds like her parents might potentially be a big thorn. OP replies, I replied to someone else asking about what ifs, at least in regards to my parents. Let's just say for example, I folded to her ultimatum, which I won't, I'd be charging them the real rent to live on the property. I had an evaluator come out to look at the property, they couldn't live in a room for more than three months. I'd charge them extra anyways. We haven't talked about conditions because I've shut down the conversation entirely. My conditions are they don't move in, and if they do, they are paying for everything themselves and the rent. We've talked about them disrespecting me and how I have gone no contact with her parents already. She talks to them two to three times a week. I haven't spoken to them since her dad said no to my proposal question. The issue comes with, there's only a small group of people who are capable of renting out a property like that, and since it's a generational home, I want to keep it as close to the family as possible. I don't want strangers changing anything, even if it's repainting the walls or swapping out a fridge. Her parents are a massive thorn. The issue is I've learned to live with the pain. Coming to Reddit seems like a stupid idea, but since I browsed Reddit before, why not get random people on the internet's opinion before I go to my family? I literally don't gain or lose anything by asking Reddit. I just wanted unbiased opinions from a large portion of people who maybe had terrible in-laws or maybe made some mistakes and have wisdom. I think maybe instead of avoiding the conversation, I need to sit down with her and have a raw conversation instead of just pretending it didn't happen. DLPG585 replies, Man, talking to parents two to three times a week shows that they are a huge part of her life. She is currently dreaming that you and her parents make nice and you all live as one big happy family. That is a complete fantasy. This is honestly in the territory of irreconcilable differences. This was going to come up with or without money. You need to be prepared to put this chapter of your life behind you. I know that you don't feel spiteful, but you will regret making decisions while angry. You will doubt them. Don't. It is not reasonable for you to have to share a large piece of your life with people who have mistreated you. At the same time, it's not reasonable to force your significant other to cut out such a large part of her life. This ultimatum is the best thing that could have happened. You now have a chance to step back and evaluate whether this is really where you want your life to go. I'm sure that you care about her and that she helped you in tough times. Do your best to keep things amicable, but be prepared for them to get ugly. Remember that this is not about money. This is about fundamental differences between you and her that were going to come up regardless. If you decide to part ways, there will be someone else, for both of you. Life moves on. Appreciate what you had, don't focus on what could have been. What could have been doesn't exist, and probably never would. Be very careful. And now, on to the update. This will be my only update post available for this subreddit. In the 48 hours since I've posted, that thing took off like a rocket ship. I'd like to start off by thanking everyone for their opinions. While a majority of you told me to leave, others offered compromises, logical alternatives, and gave me questions I didn't even think to ask myself. I'll put a TLDR at the bottom, but I probably won't need it. 
I think this has been the longest 48 hours of my life, reading through comments, responding to them, having meetings IRL, and talking with my fiancé have really given me clarity on what my next choices in life are going to be. 1. I've postponed the wedding. While some of you may refer to it as calling her bluff, I call it waiting and seeing. As of right now, we are really talking about how compatible we truly are, going over our goals in life again, and talking in depth about the relationship we want with our in-laws if we got married. Apparently a lot had changed since the last time we talked about it. Before I got money, some of you called it. 2. Yes, she genuinely thought moving her parents in would make my relationship with them better over time. I've expressed that as a result of all they've said and done to me, any positive relationship or communication with them will only be done out of necessity. For example, if she was pregnant, in the hospital, or any life-altering complication or celebration. She did not take this well, but that was expected, but it's important that I tell my truth. She believes I'll come round and try to build a relationship with her parents, but as of right now, I can't see myself doing it. 3. My parents won't be moving in, as I haven't even asked them yet. I know some of you were confused and assumed that it was already happening. It was not. I asked if it was okay if they could, not telling her that it was happening. Some of you suggested that maybe moving them in as newlyweds was weird, and suggested building them a small house on property. I didn't think about that, and will talk to my accountant and parents about it whenever that conversation needs to be talked about. Nice idea, Reddit strangers. 4. What have I been doing? A lot of meetings about my future, finances, and setting up trusts and wills. I've been re-enrolling into schools to take classes on business, finances, accounting, and economics, as my accountant suggested I do. We're still working on a budget, but as of right now, my next steps are furthering my education to manage my newfound wealth and opportunity in a healthy way as to not blow it. As of right now, to be honest, I'm emotionally drained. I think the weight of my grandfather's death is finally hitting me, despite it being months later, and the only thing that kept me going was the idea of the wedding day. With that being postponed, I can really only focus on myself, my values, and my emotions. Staying up all night and drinking at a gravesite isn't healthy, and I've not only promised myself to cut back on the booze, but also not stay up drinking. I've been thinking about maybe getting into some sort of therapy and grief counselling, but I'd need to make sure that that's in the budget with my accountant, as that's a long-term thing. Maybe they know someone. 5. Couples counselling. To those that suggested it, that's a wonderful idea. However, I'm not sure if I can move past her strange dependent relationship with her parents. Initially I thought that I could, but with the rose-tinted goggles off, I'm starting to see a lot of red flags that I'm not too confident a therapist and wedding can solve. We both have issues we need to work through, but right now I'm not sure if we'll be working through them together. I know a lot of you said to drop the relationship, but I think after 6 years it's worth giving it a try to save it. Making a choice like that without trying to fix the problem seems silly, but I did expect a lot of those answers to come through. It's just how Reddit is. Just know that I know my worth, I know my values, and I'm not backing down. Maybe we won't work things out, and the relationship will just end. Maybe things will work out and we can continue. At least for now, 48 hours later, it is too soon to tell. 6. As for the prenup, we haven't signed anything yet. A lot of you are really harping on the nice ring and fancy vacations once a year thing. While the vacations compromise is indeed concerning, the ring issue is something we've been having conflict on for a while. My personal opinion before slash now is that rings are overpriced, silly, and serve no significant purpose in a relationship. She says that they are an important symbol of love and commitment. The compromise to the prenup in regards to the ring was, I actually buy her a better ring than I already had. Which sounds super predatory in those words, but it makes sense in my mind. She doesn't want a Titanic Heart of the Ocean style jewelry piece, just something a bit more noticeable. I probably should have elaborated on that in my original post, but hey, we all make mistakes. Which to some sounds like gold digger mentality, but I know the price range of the ring that she wants, and it's about the same range my dad spent on my mum's ring. It's something you'd see on a middle class woman's finger. Nothing huge, nothing small, just enough I guess. I still think they're just silly circles of metal and compressed dirt. There's not much to say. We sat down and talked for a while. I explained my side of things, she explained hers. 
She was upset that I postponed the wedding, but once she realized I wasn't going to fold, she agreed under the notion that it was best for our relationship to work on this before marriage. Right now, I'm taking a step back from her to clear the air and to give us time to formulate what we want on our own. I've driven the two hours to the cabin and thankfully the internet people hooked that up yesterday. I've talked to my parents, not about them like moving in, but about the situation as a whole. Leaving out, I went to the internet before I went to them. While my dad can't just abandon his job, he sends his love and support. My mom is currently making the 18 hour drive, so I wouldn't be alone by myself. I've gotten attempted phone calls from the in-laws within the last 24 hours, but I've just watched them ring and went back to doing everyday tasks like lawn work, meal prep, reading, and binge watching Netflix. It's strange, but I feel happier alone right now than I do with my fiance. Maybe it's some sign that it's not meant to be, or that I've finally been able to relax for the first time in years and have found comfort in solitude. Maybe I'm happy that my mom is going to cook me my favorite dinner as a child to cheer me up. I think as of right now though, I have a lot of work to do. Not only emotionally, but also literally. I'm thinking about doing some telework, just to still have a mainstream of income part time, as I'll probably get bored of being jobless in about a week. I need some hobbies. In the comments, Beck2010 says, Kindly, you may want to refrain from having sex with her at this point. Nothing binds two people legally like a child does. This. I foresee an unexpected miracle baby in his future, one where she got pregnant on birth control. P.S. When it comes to child support, that prenup will be worthless. One thing I want to say, when you're talking about enough money to need a trust, you tell your accountant you need enough money to go to a therapist. If you broke your leg, would you be saying, I'll have to see if my accountant says there's enough money for surgery and physical therapy in the budget. No, you'd be telling your accountant, hey, a medical issue came up and I need an extra X dollars a month in the budget to manage it. Yes, it's good to have an accountant to help you manage large sums, and yes, it is good to listen to them a lot of the time, but if you have the money, don't neglect your mental health due to an artificial budget. OP replies, that's what I'm going to do. We've talked about budgets, medical emergencies, the whole nine yards. I just want to make sure that therapy is in the budget, that money is being allocated to that specific expense, and I know nothing about accounting. I want to make sure that I'm doing this the right way, because I want to make sure my kids, whenever I have kids, are set up. I've only in the past day started thinking about therapy. My accountant has no idea that I want to start something like that, and therapy is expensive. So of course I need to ask my accountant to expand the budget for therapy costs around how much I should spend and if they know any resources or individuals who are good at being therapists. Dude, good luck, but I think that you'd be a lot happier breaking up with her. You barely know each other. Six months isn't enough time. Her parents don't like you and don't want you married. Make sure you're wrapping it up and she's not poking holes in the condoms because she sounds like someone who would baby trap you. OP replies, that's such a strange idea, and apparently a rather popular comment. We haven't done the deed in some time, and with all these comments coming up about a possible baby trap, I'll probably stay away from that until we figure ourselves out. And you know what? I'm with everyone else on that one, OP. I do actually think you guys should break up at this point. Those parents are ruthless, they are not going to stop, and it seems as though she is not going to cut contact with them because they are such a huge part of her life. I can see why you still want to fix things with her and why you think it's possible, but from an outside perspective, I don't think it's worth it. And yeah, I'm getting an instinctual feeling of this that she probably will try to baby trap you. Who knows why, but people just do that. Anyway, I'd love to know what you guys think of this one down in the comments below. Let me know. And our next post is titled, Am I the asshole for not giving up my room for my grandparents? So a couple of years ago, I got a new king-sized bed to go in my room, the larger one, one of me and my sisters, with the rule that every time my grandparents visit, I give up my room. I have had no problem with this, and have given up my room about four or five times in the past couple of years. For context, my grandmother snores very loud, and my grandfather usually takes guest room upstairs, so it would really just be my grandma sleeping in my bed alone. This year, my grandparents are visiting for my birthday. It is my 17th birthday, and I thought with my sister moving out, they would take her room. Apparently not, as last night, my parents asked me to give up my room. 
I told them that I wanted my own room for my birthday, and they said that they will move my sister's bed into my room so that I could have my own room. I complained again, saying that I want my own bed in my own room for my birthday. They got mad at me and called me disrespectful and that I wasn't obliging to the rules of getting the king size bed. Am I the asshole? Edits, it isn't a new bed. It is my parents' old bed as they got a new one. I'm not a very outgoing person and I like having my own space to calm myself down and have some time alone. All of my personal belongings are in my room and I like having them all close by. But when my grandparents visit, I can't go into my room. Sister's bed is a queen size and still very comfortable. I do not want to inconvenience my parents to have to take both beds apart and move them. Now in retirement, my grandparents visit once every two months for at least a week at a time, which can be a hassle. OP has offered the following explanation for why they think they might be the asshole. I think I'm the asshole because I'm not obliging to the rules that my parents gave me when I got my king size bed. I yelled at them and told them that I'm not giving up my room. I'm just gonna say it, I do think you're an asshole for that because there were no stipulations and no further agreements that you guys came to that, hey, when I have a birthday, I get to stay in my own room. You didn't think of that at the time, albeit that was a long time ago. But the point stands, you've set a precedent and now you're trying to break it out of nowhere. Of course, that's going to cause some tension, but nowhere in your agreement did you say, birthdays are an exception. Obviously, I'm not part of your family, I don't know what the dynamics are like, I don't know what your grandparents are like, but from the outside looking in, it just seems like you're causing drama for no good reason. So I'm gonna say that you're the asshole for this one. In the comments, Righteous Vengeance says, Everyone sucks here. On the one hand, you did agree to this, and there was no provision in your verbal contract unless it's your birthday. On the other hand, your grandparents should be willing to take your sister's room, rather than kick someone out of their own bed. Technically, the deal was the room. Perfect story for malicious compliance. Grab some tools, put the good king bed in sister's room, and leave a nice empty room that they can all have together themselves. Info. Why is it so important that they sleep in your room and in your bed? OP replies, I have the biggest room in the house, other than my parents, and I have the biggest bed, king size, with a memory foam mattress. My room is where they feel is the most comfortable for sleeping. Well, okay. In that case, no assholes here. You're allowed to have an opinion, and they're allowed to have an opinion too. However, I would just give up my bed since it's the nice thing to do, especially if it happens very rarely. Not the asshole. You agreed when there wasn't an empty room for them to use. In that context, them using yours makes sense. There is now an empty room. If the purpose of the agreement was to give the grandparents a bed, it is no longer necessary and should have been revisited. Now they're just kicking you out because they can. Also, if there is no need, the invasion of privacy of sleeping in someone else's actual bed or bedroom would creep me the F out. Parents should make sister's room a guest room so that this isn't an issue in the future. Posted by user Venus Divine, titled, I don't think I will ever forgive my sister. Last year in October, I, 22 female, was working at a nursing home in the kitchen. Both siblings of mine, male 29, female 31, worked there. My brother in the kitchen, my sister a nurse. I loved the work. I loved the residents. I had a bit of unease working with my older sister though. We didn't see eye to eye is an understatement. In her words, I'm everything wrong with my parents' life. I'm a horrible person. My mother should have let our abusive stepdad beat me straight so that I would behave better. She's told them to kick me out repeatedly calling me a freeloader, a drug addict for smoking weed, a brat, and a leech. Never mind she's a drunk and has been since she could start drinking, even drinking and driving constantly. It was two weeks before Christmas, and I started having sudden extreme swelling in my abdomen with pain so bad that it made me cry. I was supposed to see the doctor that day, but had to work even though I had requested the day off. I was sent home in tears with my stomach making me look heavily pregnant and the pain so bad that no one could touch me. My first visit to the ER was a bust. I was given morphine and told that it was my PCOS and then sent home with heavy painkillers. My brother tagged along for the trip, saying he was under the impression because of my sister that I was being dramatic and had bad cramps, even going as far as to tell my parents to just leave me there and come back when they release me so he could get his shopping done. This didn't go over well with me, obviously. 
Cue me going back to work, and the same happened. The swelling, the pain, the tears. I could barely walk. It was a pained waddle at best. But I was told by my lovely sister to just suck it up and come into work, even telling me that if I missed work again that I would be fired. Two days in a row I was sent home, and then told to resign until my medical issues were resolved. Even the nursing staff was worried. One of the ladies telling me that I should be in the hospital and not work, as I looked nine months pregnant with the swelling. Another ER visit was the same result, with no improvement. After I quit, my sister descended like a vulture. She started doubling down on telling my parents to kick me out, telling everyone I'm just too lazy to work now, even going as far as to tell her own parents that I don't need a doctor, I need a psychiatrist, because I'm crazy and faking everything. She told me, on my birthday, five drinks in and right in front of my parents as I was talking about bills, that I wouldn't actually have to worry about the bills if I actually kept a job. I never talk back. I'm the quiet one. I don't fight back, but I was done. I turned and pointed at her and said, Don't you start. Don't you even effing start with me. I am tired. I am sick. Just effing stop. Her eyes got as wide as silver dollars. My birthday is just before Christmas, and I haven't talked to her since. On Christmas Day, I remember passing everyone their gifts with a smile. When I got to her, I tossed it at her really hard and just said, You. I didn't even thank her for anything. Now she does nothing but try to get me to talk, compliments on the gift I gave, asking how I'm feeling, trying to ask our mum how I am, or asking my brother to see if I'll tell him anything. I have a stomach biopsy and endoscopy scheduled, then multiple OBGYN visits, and even more tests after that. I'm refusing to tell her about any of it. As far as I'm concerned, I don't have a sister. Oof, yep, all I can say is that she sounds like an absolute pain in the side. I think you're absolutely right for lashing out at her like you did. She sounds evil. It doesn't seem as though she cares about you, and her attempts after the fact are just even more toxic. It sucks that you're not in a position where you can go fully no contact with her, although your current efforts at no contact are very commendable, so I think you're doing a very good job, OP. In the comments, LeoPhoenix93 says, OP, your sister sounds like an alcoholic and a beer. Your family doesn't sound that much better since they seem to follow her. Family can suck. OP replies, She and my brother are closer than either of them are to me. She is definitely the favourite. Our mother fully admitted it, but even they are getting tired of her acting like this. Well, it's time to prioritise you and your mental health. Get to a place where you can cut out anyone not bringing any positive to your life. Scary Alternative 11 says, I really hope you get better soon, and I am so sorry you have such a vile and disgusting person as a sister. I'm glad that you stood up for yourself. OP replies, Thank you. I truly appreciate it. I honestly shocked myself by telling her off, but I am a bit proud of myself for it. Do you think your sister could have been doing something to you at work to cause your symptoms and force you to quit? It seems like she was just waiting for that to happen, you quitting, to attack you. I hope you find out what is wrong and get well soon, and get away from your family. OP replies, I severely doubt it. I don't think she hates me enough to hurt me. And unless she slipped something into my morning coffee or lunch, I don't think she'd have an opportunity to do anything. Thank you for the well wishes. My dad has a condition called diverticulitis. It sounds similar to what you're describing, except for the swelling abdomen. It's triggered by certain foods that he's recently eaten. Maybe keep a food, drink, symptoms log until your appointment, along with any medications that you try to treat it with. That might help when you go to the doctor. It could help expose any patterns to your symptoms that might help the docs come to a diagnosis. And OP replies, That's what my doctors thought as well. As of right now, it's one of many tests they've done recently. Fingers crossed, my results should be soon. And now, on to the update. After five long months, I have a status update. About five or six months ago, I lost my job and relationship with my sister due to a mystery illness that she swore I was faking. Newsflash, I wasn't. After more tests than I can count, I have an answer. Well, sort of. As it turns out, I have a very large cyst on my ovaries that is bleeding, causing even more irritation and pain in the long run. Endo is a strong contender for a diagnosis as well, 
So no, dear sister, I don't have the magic power to inflate my stomach, cry on command, and I don't make myself puke for attention. I'm currently awaiting a doctor's visit, going over treatment, and even possibly surgery. Unfortunately, my mother has told my sister everything, which she accomplished by taking my mum out on mummy-daughter days and spoiling her with more gifts than you can imagine. Unsurprisingly, I was never included. She still makes snide comments and even took her fork while we were at dinner one night, poked my stomach repeatedly, and said for everyone and God to hear, Wow, I never thought I'd see the day your stomach doesn't look like a balloon. What changed? You don't look as fat and swollen. The look I gave her could melt a hole through a diamond. So I told her, it's because I'm not in pain right now, you asshole. My mom is trying to get me to be nice to her, telling me, that's just how she is. She doesn't mean anything bad. She's your sister, and I didn't raise you two to not get along. I told her if my sister didn't mean what she said, then she should apologize for making those comments. As of right now, she's still on my shit list. Mum is definitely climbing the list, but I have good news. I got a new job. It's well paid and low impact, plus I get three breaks a day and weekends off. I even have paid holidays off. I'm loving it, and although it's hard work, I'm excited to finally pick up the pieces of my life. My brother even told me that I was the hardest worker they had at my old job, and unfortunately, the replacement isn't even doing half of what I could do in a day. And while I miss my residents, and I still know their special orders by heart, I have never felt such relief in knowing that who I work with now don't even know my family. I can chat with them without my sister breathing down my neck, or my brother shushing me for being friendly. I am not 100% yet, and I have a long road ahead, but I'm doing it with my head held high and the best stride that I can muster. Edit, holy cow, I never expected for this to get the traction that it did. I'm in tears, and I can't thank you guys enough for the kind words and callouts in the comments. It makes me feel less alone, and I couldn't even begin on how much it means to me that people actually care. A little clarification though on a few points. My mother does believe that I'm sick. She even goes to the doctor with me and comforts me when I'm doing really, really bad. She grew up in an abusive household and really doesn't have a close relationship with her family, so she raised us to get along so that we could have the relationship that she never could. It's no excuse for her response, but it does mean I understand where she's coming from. Again, not an excuse for the bad response, but she does care and she's been helping me out a lot. My sister can be a good person when she wants to be. When she wants to be is the catch. I still love her. She raised me when my parents had to work double shifts in long days, and is the reason that I still eat ramen when I'm sad, lol. She's always been mean, but now she seems to be getting meaner, and she's going through bad things too, but that's no excuse to be horrible. I just hope that whatever is biting her butt lets go soon. My brother and I have always been close, and he asks how I feel whenever I see him. When I lost my job, he bought my pets food. When I needed a ride into town and had no gas money, he let me crash at his place for the night and took me. Sure, we fight too, but we are on better terms. As I said, there is no excuse for being dismissive or downright nasty. I'm still going no contact and low contact when I move, as I believe it's the best choice for my mental well-being. I'm putting me first. Edit 2, thank you guys for every message. I never expected this level of support from people. I've read all of them and cried a bit. And thank you to the people that are also telling me not to take this lying down. As of right now, I've already had a talk with my mum and she agreed that my sister was out of line. She did repeat, that's just how my sister is, but she did say that it was about time that I said something to her about it. And she wasn't gonna stop me. It's between me and my sister now. She's visiting in a few days, so we'll see how it goes. Although until she says something, I will be silent. As for my mum, she is no longer going into my appointments with me. She agreed to sit in the waiting room for me unless I desperately needed her help. In the comments, Tom AF asks, Why bother with your sister? What's the point of putting yourself through her nastiness? And OP replies, I currently live with my parents, and since she's here often, I can't really avoid her. Sometimes she just looks in my room at me and then leaves. I'm not talking to her, and I'm trying to avoid her when I can. Can we start to finally truly normalize that the person wronged does not have to be the bigger person? I'm so sick of hearing how Opie's mum responded. Yeah, she's awful, but that's just how she is. 
so you should be nicer to make things easier for everyone. Like what the actual hell? No, just no. She just knows sister is more difficult to deal with, so she's trying to get you to smooth things over. You need to tell your mum that you don't need to be nice to people who treat you poorly. If she wants things to be better, then she needs to hold her accountable for her horrible behaviour. And quit using the excuse that that's just how your sister is. Until then, and sister apologises, you don't have anything further to say. I'm glad you're doing better and have found happiness in your new job. OP replies, Thank you. It's a good job and I'm learning new skills along the way. And yes, I definitely need to put my foot down on this next time it's brought up. I feel like I'm still new to actually standing up for myself, so it's hard not to just bow my head and accept it. Your mum didn't raise y'all to not get along? Yet here is your sister doing her best to make sure that you two don't get along. Something's not adding up. I think your mum's got her maths wrong. Anyways, congrats on the new job, OP. Wishing you the best. OP says, Thanks. I love it so far, and they have been very understanding about my condition. I see my primary very soon, and my mother has always done this. She had my sister and my brother a decade before having me, and she even admitted that my sister is her favourite to our faces because my sister is a nurse. Your mom is just as shitty as your sister, unfortunately. She has, and still is, let your sister abuse you. OP replies, Sadly, nothing new. Your sister's a nurse? And yet she's treating you like that? I'm really sorry that you had to go through that. I'm hoping you'd be able to move out soon. OP says, I'm working on it. And yep, a nurse for 9 years, a drunk for 10, and an ass for the rest of the time.